it takes a couple of minutes, so it's working. We don't have any attendees yet, or will they all pop in once once you go live? We are live now. Good evening, Virtual Council Rock community, and welcome to our virtual special meeting of the Board of School Directors. Um, Mr. Salomon, can you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? <clears throat> Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Salomon. Uh, Madam Secretary, may I have a roll call, please? Yep. Um, Denise Brooks? Denise Brooks? Here. Um, Mark Bilek? Here. Bilek? Here. Joe Hidalgo? Here. Kristen Marcel? Here. Marion McKee? Here. Ed Solomon? Here. Ed Tate? Ed Tate? No? I thought I saw him. Uh, he's here. It appears he's having issues with his audio at the moment. Okay. Andy Block? I'm here. Mike Thorwart? Here. Okay. Everyone's here. Okay. Great. Uh, Mr. Cox, solicitor's report, please. Mr. Cox, solicitor's report. He appears to be frozen. Mr. Cox, it looks like you're on mute. Uh, more than that, I think he appears to be frozen. Can you hear me? Yes, Ed, we can hear you. All right. Let's give him a second. Looks like he popped off. See if he pops back on. Uh, I will. I will make note here that the next section uh, of our agenda is for public comment. There was no public comment uh, specific to the item on the agenda for the special meeting. Uh, we did receive uh, public comment uh, on some of the other topics that we have, and those uh, comments will be read uh, in the joint committee uh, meeting relative to or, or following the discussions on those topics. We have Mr. Cox back by chance. I do know that he had nothing to report other than to reiterate that the board had an executive session on uh, Friday, April 24th to uh, uh, with the topic of collective bargaining. Um, so without Mr. Cox, why don't we move forward to, uh, to our item for approval. Ms. Marcel, if you could uh, please read the motion. I move to approve the proposed final 2020-2021 general fund budget on the form PDE 2028 and direct the administration to make the proposed final budget available for public inspection. Second. Is that a second, Mr. Bilek? Yes, that's a second. Excellent, thank you. Um, and just as a reminder to everybody, this for the most part is a purely procedural vote and does not uh, uh, make any commitments around our budget process. We still have uh, a month or so uh, left. Uh, Mr. Stone, would you like to make any comment or, or Dr. Frazier? I, I will please, Mr. Block, um, and thank you for noting that this is a, just simply a required approval in the Act 1 process. Um, I'll point out just some pertinent information about the proposed final budget. Uh, the proposed final budget shows a deficit of just under $6 million and reflects the work that we will be reviewing at the Finance Committee after this special meeting. Uh, it also assumes a 3.1% real estate tax increase, which was the same assumption that was used in the preliminary budget that was put forth in uh, January. So there's obviously still work to do. And as Mr. Block noted, this is not a final budget. It's simply the next step in the required Act 1 process. Are there any questions for Mr. Stone? <clears throat> Hearing no questions, uh, Madam Secretary, if I can have a roll call vote, please. Okay. Uh, Mark Bilek? Yes. Ed Tate? Yes. Mike Thorwart? Yes. Denise Brooks? Yes. Marion McKee? Yes. Joe Hodago? Yes. 
Kristen Marcel? Yes. Ed Solomon? Yes. Andy Block? Yes, motion passes 9-0. Uh, and that concludes the uh, the agenda for our special meeting. Are there any board comment before I close the meeting? Mr. Block, if I could just add a note of um, addition to uh, this evening's action that the final budget approval, we are targeting our June board meeting, which I believe is June the 18th. So just so anyone tuning in has an understanding that we do have about five or six weeks left in this uh, in this budget process. And, and prior to that, is there another virtual public meeting? There should be, correct? There will be. There, are, there will actually be two. So we'll have okay. our May 21st meeting, uh, which will be a board business meeting. And then we are, I'm not sure what the first Thursday is there in June, but uh, we will have a, another joint committee meeting just like this one, the first Thursday in June. Thank you, Dr. Frazier. See, Dr. Thorward's hand is up. Yeah, I just want to note, because we've got a lot of attendees out there, that there's another meeting immediately after this. This was a special meeting, so stay tuned. We're not done. Um, that just went too fast, and I don't want people to be uh, misled here. That we're finished. Thank you, Dr. Thorwart. You just stole my thunder. <laughs> I, have a, I have a question. Yep. Um, did we uh, talk about public comment or no? I apologize if I missed that. Yes, yes, we, we, we took public comment. Uh, Okay. throughout the day and prior. Uh, we have public comment that's set up by topic. Uh, there was nothing pertaining to the uh, special uh, meeting of the board and the, the, the budget. Uh, all of the public comment that we received will be read um, after following the discussion in the committee, committee meeting consistent with what we did uh, at the last joint committee meeting. Okay, I just wanted to make sure we weren't missing it. Yep, no, not at all. They're all there. Okay, with that, uh, Dr. Frazier, oh, uh, any more board comment? Hearing none, we will officially close the special meeting and we'll uh, uh, open our uh, committee, uh, joint committee meeting. And Dr. Frazier, I'll turn that over to you to facilitate. Dr. Frazier dropped off. Uh, his mic is muted. Okay. There we go. I was talking. You just weren't here. <laughs> all right. Good evening to everyone here once again. Uh, certainly hope that all of you are healthy and well, and we thank you for tuning in this evening. Um, I want to first give a shout out to our amazing faculty and staff here in Council Rock during what is this week's Teacher Appreciation Week. I, I would just tell you that I continue to be humbled and impressed not only with the quality of their work, but also with their commitment to their craft, and most importantly, by their commitment to our students. If you haven't had a chance to thank a CR teacher or staff member lately, I encourage you to perhaps find that opportunity to do so. We have so many who are so deserving, and I know that I'm thankful, and once again, I extend my personal gratitude to them. Uh, now, as far as this evening goes, we have a number of important topics for committee discussion. Uh, as many of you know, we've been working to ensure that we celebrate the class of 2020 with class, grace, and dignity that they have earned and that they deserve after these four years of a Council Rock High School experience and after the entirety of their 13 years going back to the very first days of school in kindergarten. Uh, Mr. Sanko, uh, Ms. McCarthy, and Mr. Funk will all talk this evening about the work and thinking that's been done to date and planning to rightfully celebrate this class of students and soon to be Council Rock alumni that comprise the class of 2020. Also this evening, Mr. Taylor will discuss an RFP uh, that we recently put out for our custodial services. We're looking for some improvements relative to some of the past levels of service. And this is part of what prompted us to seek these additional proposals. And as many of you know, and as we just touched upon, we are certainly in the, in the midst of a challenging budget situation. And that's true, not just for the upcoming school year, whose budget we're currently working on. And again, we'll uh, look to pass on June 18th, but undoubtedly this, uh, this challenging situation will be true for uh, subsequent years as well. So this evening, Mr. Stone will bring us all up to speed on current projections in this volatile economy. And we'll also present over $3 million in budgetary reductions 
that we've been working to identify over the past several weeks. Uh, you will hear this evening from various cabinet members on the call about these reductions. And to start us off this evening, Dr. Elliott is going to provide an overview of some instructional materials that we've been planning to, uh, to introduce in the fall for the upcoming school year. Now, we're presenting these resources this evening in the event that we are able to include these instructional resources in the 2020-21 budget while recognizing that we not yet whether we can afford to do so. The one situation certainly that we want to avoid here is being uh, ultimately able to fund them and then not having previously reviewed them uh, at a board committee meeting. So that is what will happen now. And without further ado, Dr. Elliott, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Frazier and good evening board members. Give me a second while I share my screen. All right. So this evening, I'm going to um, start first with our um, education committee agenda with our textbook approvals, and then we'll turn it over to Andy Sanko to talk about celebrating the class of 2020. So as a recap with our textbook approvals, in February, uh, board members received a a uh, document with a um, list of seven textbooks that we were planning to bring forward to the board for approval. Uh, those resources were also on display in um, Historic Classroom One in Chancellor Center for folks to review. Uh, as per our normal practice that we put the textbooks on display for review and provide information a month in advance of the meeting where we will be asking for approval. The uh, just as a quick summary, the total cost of uh, those seven resources was three hundred nineteen thousand five hundred twenty six dollars and eighty nine cents. As part of our work in finding budget reductions and some savings uh, in our budget work, we have revised that uh, list of requests uh, for textbook approvals to just three resources that uh, based on our analysis of uh, where we are curricularly and what some of our needs are, these are three resources that um, would be top priority at this moment in time. The total cost of those three resources is $232, six, $604.86. Um, so as Robert mentioned, we are um, presenting these to you tonight for um, question for your review, and we are looking potentially for approval of these in June, um, uh, pending our continued work with our budget. Our first uh, resource is a more than a textbook. It is for our seventh and eighth grade um, reading classes, all of our reading classes in seventh and eighth grade, and this is a new. Um, comprehensive resource to support reading instruction in the middle school. It is called Into Literature. Um, these next two slides that you'll see refer to this same resource because I'm going to show you some cost differences as we've been doing some of this budget work. So this resource is a new and much needed resource um, for our reading courses. Starting in 2018, we began piloting um, an, this new material to explore whether or not it was the right choice for our middle school core reading resource. And we continued the second year of a pilot this past this year in 2019-20 with a plan to implement in 2020-21. So Into Literature has a well-developed online component that um, has proven very valuable during distance learning. Um, and as per this slide, we've negotiated with them for a six year uh, subscription to all of the online components and a six year um, access to the student print material. And the total cost of that six years is $152,454.14. So uh, we, you know, we worked really hard and did a wonderful job of trying to get a really good 
really good price on this particular product. Um, in looking at our uh, work with our budget reductions, because this was one of our larger purchases for the coming year, we did look at um, the possibility of reducing that purchase. So this next slide shows you what that um, reduction might look like. So what you see here in the table um, on this slide is a comparison of the cost we um, currently have for the six-year package. And we did work with the company and they were able to give us a one-year cost um, and quote. And the one-year cost would be, as you see there on the far right-hand side, $53,519.50. While that gives us an immediate budget savings, um, one of the things to point out is if we would pay that one year cost for the next six years, our total cost over six years would be $321,454.14. The um, thing to point out here is that we don't know if we would be able to negotiate a six year or a multi-year deal if after this year we went um, back to the company and, and um, again, tried to see if we could get a multi-year deal on this particular product. Um, and again, that's something that, you know, we would have to explore in the future. But this just gives the board a sense of what the cost would be and the, and the savings if we were to stick with the six-year package that we have now versus going with a one-year package and then having to pay that over time. Um, for the same, the same product and the same services that we're getting. The next resource is a resource for um, science for elementary school for uh, fourth grade. It's a new science kit um, on energy. Our current kit is 18 years old and does not have an online component to it. Uh, additionally, we can no longer get the replacement parts for the current kit that we have. They're being discontinued. This new kit includes ebooks, online teaching slides, and online lessons and video simulations that um, can be used if we would um, be returning to some form of distance learning next year. This new kit has the capability to support that. Um, the kit also provides a database of science and engineering careers, and many STEM activities. We have piloted this kit for two years and would have to pay for the pilot if we continue um, without purchasing the kit. And the final uh, textbook that we have is for German three and German three honors. It's called Deutsch Aktul. And this particular resource is part of our work um, with our world language curriculum in updating it over time. Um, if you remember from last year, we updated German one and two. So this is the next update in the series. This also comes with an online component um, and we are getting a six year subscription with that online component as well. And the online component includes many resources that would help with any distance learning including audio selections by native speakers, videos, immediate feedback on the auto graded practice activities that are included and the ability to annotate and take notes online. As um, Dr. Frazier mentioned um, at the start of this committee meeting, um, we are not seeking board approval of these textbooks at the May meeting because we understand that uh, we need to continue doing some of the budget work that we need to do, but these three um, resources are um, top priorities of the seven that we had originally planned to bring to the board. Um, but again, um, we will um, call with the budget whether or not we will continue to move forward with bringing these for approval to the board. Um, at this time, are there any questions about the resources before we move on to the next agenda item? And Ed, I'll turn that over to you. Uh, just to appreciate you. Uh, sorry. Thank you, Dr. Elliott. Board um, members, questions? None. Uh, Mary Ann has her hand up. 
Yes, uh, it's Marianne. Uh, just a quick question. For the seventh and eighth grade literature uh, materials, how old are the materials that these would be replacing? Uh, Marianne, I'll have to get that answer for you. I don't have that um, information in front of me. I know that one of the challenges that we had at the middle level was we felt that we did not have a good comprehensive program to be right. using with our students. And, and this was um, our work at trying to find a comprehensive program that actually would be better for students than what we were using. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Andy Block. Thank you, Mr. Tate. Um, I just want to uh, tell the administration, appreciate you kind of self-selecting and prioritizing what's most important. Um, and and uh, it would be interesting as we go through the budget process, you know, if you really feel strongly, there's some other things that you didn't bring forward. Um, you know, when you look at the academic uh, budget, that's kind of the last place that, that we want to go. So as, as we get through the budget process, if there are things that you feel that you didn't present that you feel we, we really should take a look at, let's let's make sure that we do have that conversation through the process. But uh, thanks for prioritizing. Certainly. Joe Hidalgo. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Elliott. Um, I just wanted to double check, all, all, all these books have the six year subscription or did the, did the fourth grade science also have a six year online subscription? Uh, the fourth grade kit is a little bit different. It's not so much a subscription as just the online activities are available. Um, so it's not quite the same as what the, the textbooks typically are. Okay, well, I'm very happy that we that you're focusing on the online subscriptions with all future purchases. I think that's great. So thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Elliott. The next item on the agenda is high school graduations and celebrating the class of 2020, Mr. Sanko. Thank you, Mr. Tate. Um, good evening. First to the class of 2020. This global pandemic has interrupted and disrupted so many things in your world. Anyone who's not a member of the class of 2020 could never fully understand your disappointment and devastation. However, everyone is keenly aware of the angst emotion and uncertainty that this pandemic has caused, particularly as we all work together to recognize you as you ascend up upon this milestone. Your senior class leadership is to be commended. Recently, Dr. Frazier and I had the opportunity to personally meet with student leaders. They demonstrated courage, grit, and resilience while articulately advocating on behalf of the class of 2020. Class of 2020, you are well represented. Good evening, board and cabinet. As we speak about celebrating and honoring the class of 2020, our starting point has been and has to be the health, safety, and well being of students, staff, and parents. We are guided by Governor Wolf's stay at home order and must follow the process to reopen Pennsylvania. In order to have large group gatherings, we must be in the green phase of the governor's plan. Currently, as you know, Bucks County is in the red phase, which restricts large group events. And in fact, schools may not even open if we migrate to the yellow phase. We must wait until we're in the green phase to reopen schools. The single most important message I can convey this evening regarding our seniors is that every single adult Every single decision maker, every single student leader is committed to providing the class of 2020 what they have earned and what they deserve, a large event celebration. We're prepared to make that happen with input from every member of the Council Rock class of 2020. We desire the same thing for our students as they do. Though the class of 2020 has capable and strong leadership, we will be reaching out to every member of this graduating class by way of a survey to seek input for a celebration to take place as soon as it's deemed safe by the governor. Again, it is of utmost importance to all of us to bring the class of 2020 together as one class at least one more time. 
Please know that district leadership has read and vetted each and every email and suggestion that, suggestion that has been sent our way. We've, we've reviewed and vetted things like car parades, drive-in style theaters, alternate venues offering a large viewing screen. Obviously, all these ideas are very good, but we cannot do them all and all cannot be employed. Thank you to those of you who have taken time to send emails, share suggestions, offer help, and who the folks who made personal telephone calls on behalf of the class of 2020. That includes our students who've also reached out personally. People in this community care deeply about each and every student, and many people have poured hours and hours into this process investigating each and every suggestion. As a reference point, I offer that we've clearly vetted alternate venues. We've consulted with every Bucks County High School and high schools in net neighboring counties. We've attended national uh, graduation webinars that were sponsored by graduation companies so we could learn what other school districts across the country are doing. We had contact with online universities and cyber schools to see, uh, seek suggestions and ideas that may benefit our students. While doing this work, the senior leaders have been meeting regularly with high school, high school administrators to ask questions, offer ideas, and to help creatively problem solve. The consistent and strong message from the students is that they want to be with their friends. They desire to have a large group event, be it a typical graduation ceremony, a class picnic, walk through the halls of their high school, or any combination thereof, they are consistent in, sta in stating they just want to be with their friends. And we want that too. As we looked at this body of work, we determined that we must take a multi-pronged approach to honor and celebrate the class of 2020. The first prong, as I mentioned earlier, is obvious, the health, safety, and well-being of everybody. The second prong is the conferral of diplomas. It is our strong belief that it is important to recognize the class of 2020 by conferring diplomas on June 15th. This represents a major milestone for each senior, and it marks the completion of 13 years of dedication and hard work, including the last four years of the comprehensive high school experience. We are all keenly aware that nothing we do or that can be done at this moment will replace the traditional graduation that occurs under normal circumstances. The third prong in our approach is honoring seniors with a large event gathering. The challenge in the moment is the when, and that is predicated by the governor's order. It is important to know and understand that the virtual graduation is not in place of, but rather in addition to a time that the class of 2020, their family and friends can all safely gather and celebrate. Please let me say that again. It's important to know and understand that the virtual graduation is not in place of, but rather in addition to a time that the class of 2020 and their families and their friends can safely gather to celebrate. We know that some of our neighbor, neighbors postponed graduations and selected a hard date. We discussed that ad nauseum. The fact is no one knows if those dates can be honored given this pandemic. We have carefully and thoughtfully worked with our students and our team and put a significant level of import on the conferral of diplomas. Earning the high school diploma is the pinnacle of one's high school career. Our students will have achieved what is expected of them by Council Rock and by the state of Pennsylvania on June 15th. In simple terms, we do not want our students beginning a career, starting a military experience, or heading off to college without their diploma. They have earned it. We have some work that has been done in preparation of this began the day after Governor Wolf announced the April 30th stay at home order was extended to May 8th. Since then, we have worked with 
a professional videographer so that we can ensure that we have a crisp, clean, professionally done online graduation ceremony for our seniors. The virtual graduation will contain all the same ingredients of a typical graduation, minus all of us being able to be there in person. It will contain student speakers, pomp and circumstance, the alma mater, presentation of students uh, with an accompanying captioned video, principal speeches, a speech by Dr. Frazier, a conferral of diplomas by Mr. Block, the president of the school board, and it will be done um, in the spirit of our Council Rock seniors. We will follow that same method and model with regard to the virtual awards recognition. Once again, we will not be able to put everybody into the auditorium and acknowledge and recognize our distinguished scholars and our scholarship winners. But we will put together a similar presentation working with a professional videographer to make that happen. Each high school will hang a plaque with a, a panoramic photo honoring and recognizing this class of 2020 and the turbulent times everyone is experiencing. Each of our students, when they enter high school in ninth grade, they begin raising money. And that money that they raise follows them until their senior year. That money is dedicated to their class. Each year, every single dollar, every single dime of that money is spent on the senior class. The way that that money is spent on the senior class is by way of offsetting the cost of things like caps and gowns and yearbooks. This year, all of that money, even though students aren't in school, will be poured back into our seniors to help offset the cost of yearbooks and caps and gowns. The difference this year is the district is going to reimburse and waive the dues for every single senior. We have worked on communicating with seniors and families about picking up caps and gowns and cords and awards. Much like the diploma, it's very important that you have your caps, your gowns, your cords, and your awards. Um, that will come directly from your high school principal. Prior to distribution of the caps and gowns, a system will be implemented, allowing seniors to properly return Chromebooks, musical instruments, textbooks, athletic uniforms, and the like. Um, class of 2020, for those of you listening, you should be on the lookout for a special video message being pushed out next week. It's also important to note that we appreciate the privilege to partner with the Council Rock Education Foundation as we are going to purchase a lawn sign for each senior. Volunteers will personally deliver the lawn signs to the homes of the seniors and plant them in your yard in late May or early June. Plans have been, we've been working on plans to bring the class of 2020 together as soon as we can. We have planned as far out as Thanksgiving break of next year, as we know, if things balance out, many of you will be away. And we will want to plan something where we could have all students return and participate in the celebration activity. June 15th is your graduation day. It's the graduation day for our seniors. On June 15th, all seniors will be invited to drive through their high school campus to be celebrated by the current and former teachers. Of course, social distancing guidelines will apply. Specific details will be forthcoming because we have some other things that we have to, to um, finalize the plans on. We'll ask each family that only one car per family be permitted each high school that everyone follows the social distancing guidelines so we can ensure the health and safety of everyone. <clears throat> we would ask that seniors, you wear your cap and gown as you drive through the school parking lot on June 15th. We have not determined a time yet. And yes, seniors, you will want to decorate your car with parent permission, of course, for June 15th. If something happens with regard to the weather and the weather does not cooperate, please plan for June 17th. That is our rain date. The more, the more will evolve with regard to celebrating the class of 2020, I cannot overstate the level of commitment by the high school administrators and the student leaders. This work is challenging. 
this work is less than perfect. What is perfect is the manner in which the students, parents, and the Council Rock team have come together to do our very best to take care of all of our students. Thank you. Mr. Tate, I cannot see those who raised their hand, so if you wouldn't mind facilitating. I will. Thank you very much, Mr. Senko. That was a very thorough presentation, and, and uh, you're to be commended for the hard work you do with your colleagues and with the students. Um, it's great to see how the plan evolved with student input. So we'll open the floor to comments and questions from board members. I'm scrolling, not seeing any yet. In the interim here, Mr. Tate, um, uh, this is Dr. Frazier. Um, I'll, uh, I want to remind the board, I want to remind the board that we also have Ms. McCarthy and Mr. Funk with us this evening. Uh, so they'll be able to help answer any questions or provide uh, insights, clarification. And uh, most importantly, I do want to echo what uh, Mr. Sanko just shared, respective to our class of 2020 senior uh, government officials. Uh, the, the call that I was part of today, which is only one of many, many calls that the principals uh, and, and other folks from the schools have been having with them, um, was just so impressive. I, I, was, I was just blown away, really impressed with every single one of them from uh, just, just an attitudinal standpoint, uh, keeping their spirits high, advocating for the class of 2020, doing so in a really respectful manner, showing just a, a tremendous amount of maturity around understanding you know, the limitations that unfortunately we're faced with. And yet, you know, we all have committed to working from a place of yes, you know, let's, let's, let's enter into every suggestion with attempting to find that yes, I've heard Mr. Sanko say that several times uh, over the past several weeks and, um, and these students have, have really just found such a nice balance. Um, I, I know I wasn't that mature when I was graduating from high school and just our, our community should know that parents should know that very, very impressive and cannot possibly thank them enough for all their inputs, all their ideas, all their feedback, and just the, the sense of partnership that, that we've really enjoyed with them. Thank you, Dr. Fraser. I think it's essential that we repeat the fact that the district is committed to a senior gathering when restrictions are lifted. So let me throw a question out of left field to Ms. McCarthy or Mr. Funk. Um, who is going to be planning the senior gathering for when the restrictions are lifted? So Mr. Tate, our thought at this time would be to actually survey our, our students and their families regarding uh, what type of gathering they would, they would prefer. Uh, we will we will come together with some options, and um, of course, the the, um, the the one that we know that will be on the list will certainly be a traditional graduation, as it would have been had this not occurred. I, I would just add, Mr. Tate, that I suspect the folks who would facilitate the planning and the execution of the event would be the same ones that would typically do so: uh, senior advisors, uh, administration and the students themselves. Great, thank you, Mr. Funk. I, I see among the attendees at least one senior advisor. Uh, there's two board members with their hands up. I'll start with Mr. Hidalgo. Oh, thank you. Um, I, want, I really like the idea of the drive, uh, teacher recognizing the students with that parade or, or driving in the high schools. I'm really interested in hearing more about that, decorating the cars, and I think that that goes a long way to just to a lot of the requests that we've had. So I commend you guys for being able to be creative like that. And I was just wondering, that's gonna be on the day of graduation. So if we have a four and a six, it's gonna be a very busy day and it's gonna be a pretty celebratory uh, day because they'll be out and about and coordination sounds like it's something. But I was wondering if there's, uh, are these plans pretty much uh, a rough draft? Are we still working on 
of the details, obviously, right? So, Mr. Hidalgo, I, if I can answer that for you, we know for sure that we want to follow and we're certain we're going to follow the typical schedule that we would follow if we were in the brick and mortar. So at four, four o'clock on June 15th, we will air the virtual Council Rock North graduation, both on Council Rock TV, as well as stream it on the YouTube channel. And we know at six o'clock, we will repeat that for South. So we will stick to that time frame. So sometime throughout the course of that day, um, we will be inviting students on the 15th and their families in one car, one decorated car to, to drive through the parking lot and be recognized by um, current and former staff and teachers. Okay. Thank so you Mr. So Hildago, we are very much in the planning stage right now. Uh, generally speaking, we are, are thinking in terms of, of various stations that students will travel to uh, one to the other and, um, and hoping to even involve maybe some of the community. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it. Good, thank you, Mr. McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Sanko. Is anyone else wanting to ask a question or comment? Uh, we've received a lot of emails over the past few weeks, and I can assure you from individual conversations with other board members that we are all reading those emails and they're being read by our administrators as well. And the input that we've gotten and the questions have really shaped this thing. Um, Mr. Block, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Tate. Um, we've certainly all gotten a ton of feedback from the community. And before I share my thoughts on there, I do want to note that there's at least one hand um, jumping up and down in the attendee list. And, uh, and I'm sorry that we're, we're uh, not going to be able to, uh, to engage uh, in this particular venue, unfortunately, due to the fact that in previous meetings, we've had some, uh, some inappropriate com uh, content shared that uh, this is the only way we can control that. So I would tell the 102 folks who are listening, um, we're hopeful that you have a better understanding of our process. If there are still questions, uh, or comments, uh, please share those with uh, Mr. Sanko, Ms. McCarthy, Mr. Funk, Dr. Frazier, um, and feel free to copy the board. Um, the administrative team is working hard to come up with an outcome that meets, uh, like they said, the needs of the student uh, students. So, um, you know, from my standpoint, as, as they said, we've got to be compliant with state guidelines. Um, safety is our priority, uh, and we've got to have student involvement. And, and I'm thrilled to hear that we're doing those things and we're pushing those guidelines uh, to be able to do this drive-through on the, on, the, uh, on the 15th. I know a student parade was something that there's a lot of energy around the community for. Uh, I know there's a lot of energy to want to do more than the campuses, uh, but there's a great TikTok video circulating in our community, community that is really emotional and will give you a feel for what I believe we're trying uh, to accomplish, um, and, and, and we can get a pretty good route across both those high schools and have, have a really solid parade. Um, so I, I'm, I'm pleased that, that we're able to do that on that timeline. Um, and I think that meets uh, a lot of the needs that we've heard from the community. From, from my standpoint, I've heard that the students uh, really have a desire to say goodbye. You know, school ended on March 12th, uh, and they didn't know if they were coming back or not, and they didn't. Um, so they haven't had a chance in a lot of cases to reconnect, and that's important. So they do want to be together. Uh, they want to be near the building. Um, and and of, of utmost importance to me is they want to walk. And uh, understanding the priorities of being compliant with state guidelines and safety first, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can be creative uh, and flexible in working with them to make sure that we get uh, the best version of that um, for, for everybody. So... Um, if I can just ask two questions, Mr. Sanko, the first one is, can we put a hard date or do we have a hard date for the distribution of things like caps and gowns? I know that's been something that folks have been asking about as opposed to early June. So, so we, have, we have a hard date and we're working on a one page flyer that will go out to the community. So it's a, a one stop shop. You'll be able to see everything for uh, June 15th, June 11th, 
um, we'll take you through the rest of the, the year in terms of um, when we're picking, when we're having students pick up that uh, their caps and their gowns. Um, it's important to note that we had in, originally intended to include yearbooks in that pickup for students, but with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the printer was shut down for several weeks. So our yearbooks for our seniors are going to lag a bit behind, um, but we will get the yearbooks to our seniors as soon as we can. And so be on the lookout for that, uh, that hard date for the cap and gown pickup. Um, and I, I would only say be on the lookout for it because we are still, we have all caps and gowns for one school in our possession currently, and we're waiting for the delivery and arrival of caps and gowns for another school. Excellent. And then my second question is, I know that one of the frustrations in the community is um, the, the, the lack of our, or I should say our decision or choice not to put a date on a specific <coughs> activity because of the desire to include the community and what that activity is and, and, and meet state guidelines. Uh, as you engage the students and go through your process, um, I think people are going to be watching because the unknown can be frustrating. What's our plan to communicate where we are? Um, are we going to have check-ins? So as an example, if the governor decides to go from red to yellow um, towards the end of this month, um, you know, at, at that point, does, does, does something change in, in the speed with which we engage or how we engage or how are we going to keep people informed so the, 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 the unknown doesn't, uh, doesn't become more frustrating. Yeah, so I, I understand the frustration and the reason, one of the, one of the many reasons we didn't pick a hard date was because we have felt that our senior, all of our students, but particularly our seniors have been disappointed. Proms are being interrupted, Disney being delayed and then canceled. The Council Rock South trip, to, music trip to Ireland was canceled. The North music trip to DC was canceled. And we want to be, we don't want to pick a date where people begin to plan around and then we have to cancel it because the restrictions have not been lifted or lessened. We are prepared if by some miracle that tomorrow Governor Wolf said that we are now in the green phase, we would be prepared in short order three to five days to be able to put together an in-person graduation. Um, so the way we will keep you informed, one way is we will continue meeting with uh, the high school administrators and we will continue to meet with our student leaders. And as things evolve and we learn more, we will then be able to make a determination when we can do something with the, with the students. Okay, so, so if I were to summarize what I heard tonight, we've got a we've got the virtual graduation to confer diplomas, which is a, pl a plus one, uh, as opposed to an in place of. We've got uh, a date uh, with details to be determined that uh, should make for a great parade of sorts at each one of the high schools. We are completely committed to a celebration event or events up to and including a full graduation. Um, and or potentially other things based on feedback from the students and their families. Uh, and we'll be able to make those commitments as, uh, as, as we're able to based on state guidelines. That's correct. Okay, yeah, so like I said, the one thing that I would, I would, I would you know, I, I would make sure that we do is communicate, um, you know, as directly as we can, uh, as new information uh, comes. So the entire community can be aware of that. And, and what I'd say to, again, the 105 folks who are listening, Hopefully that gives you a sense for number one, the work that is going into this, although it might not appear that way uh, uh, from where you sit. Um, hopefully you understand the commitment of this team of administrators uh, to give uh, our seniors the best experience we possibly can in, uh, in this really difficult uh, environment. And uh, if you still have questions and or comments, uh, please share those with the administration and the board so they can be aware of those. Um, and, and hopefully this discussion has created a little bit more visibility. We've got 104 folks on the phone. Uh, I would guess just from knowing the names that there's 70 folks specific uh, to the graduation issue. So there's a lot bigger community out there impacted by this, a lot more families. Uh, we just need to make sure that we keep everybody engaged and, and aware of what's going on. 
But uh, I appreciate uh, Mr. Funk, Ms. McCarthy, uh, Mr. Sanko, the work that I know that you've been doing uh, to, 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 to make these things possible in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Black. Um, thank you also to the to senior advisors and the students involved in the planning. Um, it's really unprecedented and a challenge. Uh, I don't see any other board members wishing to comment or question at this moment. So we'll move on to public comment regarding the graduation issue. Misery, I, I believe we do have some public comment around uh, graduation, yes? Yes, we do. Thank you, Dr. Frazier, Mr. Tate. Um, we have several. The first um, comment came in from Carolina D. Simone from Newtown. Carolina says, my name is Carolina D. Simone and I'm a senior at Council Rock North. I have a couple of questions regarding graduation. How is it possible Neshaminy High School is able to have their graduation just delayed? If the dilemma is our diplomas, why can't the school mail out the diplomas so we would technically graduate, but just have a delayed ceremony? Like many others, graduation was the one thing I've been looking forward to since I started at North freshman year. I couldn't wait to pick out my white dress and walk with the people I've grown up with for one last time. Please take my questions into consideration when deciding on a decision. Next, we received a comment from Smitha Shukla. Um, did not mention the area where um, Ms. Shukla resides. During the board meeting on 5-7, please address what CRSD will do for the seniors while we are in the red phase. That should focus right now. While in the red, we are asking for the following. One, a graduate car parade. Two, a teacher parade, kids drive through the lot and wave bye to the teachers. Three, a drive-through graduation ceremony. Families drive up to a small stage. The graduates walk across the stage in cap and gown, pick up a mock diploma from the table, gets a professional photo taken, gets back in the car and drives through a set campus route where teachers are lined up cheering them on. A detailed email about this idea has been emailed to the administrators. We are anxiously awaiting to hear what can and will be done while in the red phase. Ideally, all events in red will take place between June 1st and June 15th. In the green phase, we know a traditional in-person graduation can take place. Let's focus on red phase, please, since we have no idea when we will get to the green. Our third comment came from Tina Scheider, uh, who resides in Holland. And she writes, I am writing to the school board because I have a very depressed senior due to missing out on senior events to the point that we are consulting a therapist. I'm trying to figure out how I can help. Many schools such as Neshaminy High School have rescheduled graduation for later in the summer. I realize that Council Rock does not want to do this and are planning a virtual graduation with something else being planned later. Many students and parents feel that a virtual graduation only will be very depressing for these kids and many do not want to participate. Therefore, we would like to propose something in addition to the virtual graduation to take place sometime near the date of June 15th. Here are three proposals. One, a graduation car parade where the kids can meet at the high school with decorated cars and parade into the town in their caps and gowns. We would hope that the police and the fire departments would get involved as I've seen them already do so for other celebrations in Richborough. If allowable at the time, the district could do some type of send off at the school with decorations and some staff spread socially distanced to say congratulations and make this a big deal for the kids. They could even remain by their own cars at the parking lot area where the buses usually go and the kids drive by. All students would be socially distanced because they would remain in cars all staff could remain in their cars. Something similar was just done with the Council Rock lacrosse team. Her second item is to organize an event at another location such as Shady Brook. Ask if we could use their Festival of Lights route for a car parade. Then at the end, we could all park our cars and there could be a giant movie screen or two. On the screens, we could play a video montage and then individual photos of each senior portrait 
as each student is recognized on a loudspeaker as a graduate. This was recently organized by Villa Joseph Murray High School. Three, sometimes before the virtual graduation, each individual graduate, graduate will arrive outside of the school in their cap and gown at an assigned time slot with their family to walk across and attain a diploma. This can be recorded and shown at the virtual graduation ceremony. There has to be a way to get their diplomas anyway. This is currently being done by Upper Perk Yeoman High School. I realize Council Rock has a large student body, so perhaps separating the kids by last name or elementary school attendance, et cetera, would be necessary. Please consider doing something in addition to a virtual ceremony that day or the day before, and thank you for your consideration. Next, we have a comment from Krista Mickelson, who resides in Langhorne. Krista writes, I am a senior at South and I want to present an idea for our commencement ceremony. I would like to host graduation in the Parks Casino parking lot and have some kind of presentation on the jumbo screen out front. We could park the cars a safe distance from one another because the lot is so big. Also, there could be a designated path for the students to walk up to the front to avoid contact with others. I think it is important for the seniors to actually get the chance to walk up to a stage and receive something in front of their peers and families. Even if there are other ideas about how to do the actual ceremony, I think the park's parking lot is a great location for anything we do given its large size and the screen. Of course, we would have to get permission from the casino and work with them to get everything sorted out, but I believe it is worth asking them if they would be willing to host such an event. Our fourth comment came from Luke Costello. Luke resides in the Newtown area of the township. Luke says that he is the treasurer of the class of 2020 at Council Rock North. As class officer, I have been in direct communication with our administrators at Council Rock North, as well as the district administration team. I have been thrilled with the constant communication between staff and students. Each step of the way, we have been consulted and informed about decisions being made. This started with Disney, went through prom, and is now regarding graduation. I know that our administrators have received a lot of comments from the community, as have the board. I am writing this evening to shed some light on the good faith efforts that we are making during these turbulent times. Frankly, I'm happy that I'm not in charge of making any of these final decisions because there is seemingly no right answer. We all want the same thing, to fully honor the hard work and dedication of my classmates the way it has been done. However, our hopes are sadly not aligned with the reality. The reality is this, I left the place that I poured everything into over the past four years on March 12th, and I wasn't able to say goodbye. The reality is we cannot go back to the way that it should be for a while. And the reality is we're doing our best, staff, teachers, students, and administrators. From the hours of Zoom calls that I have attended, I'm elated to report that Council Rock has and continues to support the class of 2020. When looking at disappointing news, followed by more disappointing no news, it is easy to just give up. But Council Rock has not given up, and neither have the students or their representatives. When considering where we are today, know that we are doing everything we can to be at a better place tomorrow. Thank you, Council Rock, for everything. Our next comment comes from Allison Leff, parent of Jordana Leff, who is at the class of 2020 and Allison Left resides in Upper Makefield. She writes, although myself and many others have shared various ideas in regards to how to honor the seniors at both North and South, I am summarizing the request below. As I know this is the way information is requested prior to board meetings. Seniors and families look forward to being in the green phase as per our governor, at which time a live graduation cer ceremony will be welcomed. However, in the interim, we want alternative celebrations to be held in the coming weeks, leading up to and including June 15th. June 15th. Even if our country is in yellow or even still in the red phase, there are many safe alternatives that have been presented as options, including the following. Car parade of seniors and families, live option to say goodbye to teachers in some fashion at a distance, live graduation opportunity, 
where students are scheduled over the course of several days to come take photos in caps and gowns at their high school with their immediate family member, with staff, photographers, safely at a distance. Opportunity to view virtual graduation ceremony outdoors at a distance at each elementary school with their peers and families. Our next comment is from Kate Slubowski, who resides in the Churchville area. She writes, dear board members, as a parent of a graduating senior from CR South, I kindly ask that you consider a later date in person graduation ceremony. While we have now been told that diplomas need to be distributed for summer courses, et cetera, we truly hope that as restrictions are lifted and safe social distancing measures are followed, that the board will consider an outdoor in-person ceremony for these kids. They have lost so much this year. We hope you will consider how much a ceremony would mean to all of them. They've earned this rite of passage. Next, we have a comment from Janice Mickelson, who resides in Langhorn. I am reaching out to you to share an idea for my daughter. Kristen Mickelson suggested me to last night. She expressed that she wants to walk and actually get something tangible in her hand on the day of graduation. Krista suggested having graduation in the parking lot of Parks Casino and having the seniors pictures and names on the jumbo screen. They could definitely practice social distancing as they walk up and receive their diploma. We could have police and fire department presence for support, decorate our cars and celebrate them on the day of graduation. I know it was mentioned to try and plan something for them at a later date, but honestly, I don't think that will be an option for everyone to attend. I hope you consider her suggestion and the Parks Casino would also be willing to participate. Next, we have a comment from Janice Steinmans. She says that she is requesting that this year's graduation ceremony be postponed until a later date when a more traditional in-person ceremony can be held for the class of 2020. The kids need closure, this kind of closure that comes with a graduation ceremony. The seniors need it, as well as the teachers and faculty members who have worked so hard with and for them over the past four years. Put them in a stadium or on one of our spacious fields, have them wear masks and spread them out six feet apart, just them, no parents or guests, just the class of 2020, if that's what it takes. This is not like losing Disney, prom, or a sports season. If this pandemic has taught us anything, it's taught us how little those things matter. This is about closure and moving on. It's about them being able to say goodbye, good luck, and most importantly, thank you. Thank you for the wonderful memories. It is impossible, at least in my opinion, for them to express themselves or get closure from a virtual graduation. Please, as long as it is within state and local regulations, please give them a traditional graduation. And that concludes the comments relative to graduation. Thanks, Ms. O'Grady. And, and to that last point that was just made there, that is exactly uh, our hope and our intent. Um, as, as many commenters there just noted, we are at the mercy of the governor's color-coded system and more to the point, we're at the mercy of, of this virus in our area. Um, we would love nothing more than whether it be on June 30th or July 15th or August 15th to be able to do exactly what you want and that is to have an in-person graduation ceremony uh, despite the fact that your actual degree would have been conferred uh, back on June 15th. At this point, we just don't know if that's going to be possible. We certainly hope that it is. And if it is, um, and uh, via the survey that we do, if it is our students' desire still to have that in-person ceremony, then that is exactly what we'll do. I've heard uh, Mr. Sanko reference several times uh, the very short amount of time that it takes us to ramp up and be ready for an in-person ceremony. Uh, in-person ceremonies are not difficult for us. We have a lot of history doing them and, uh, you know, they're, they're more or less on autopilot. Um, doing, doing what we're trying to do now is, uh, is what's new to us and challenging for us. And that's why it's been great that students, uh, teachers and administrators with a lot of parental input have all 
gone into this together. So please know that I think that we are very much on the same page. Uh, after June 15th, there will absolutely be an in-person gathering, whether that's a ceremony, whether that's just uh, some other more informal gathering, whatever the, uh, the students want, the students, the alums want is what they'll get. And we look forward to that. So Mr. Sanko, thank you for your leadership. Thanks for your presentation here today. I'll extend the same to Ms. McCarthy and Mr. Funk and to all of our students, uh, one of whom is Luke Costello, who uh, you just heard public comment from. And Luke is one of the students I referenced at the beginning who showed uh, today and really throughout this process, just an unbelievable amount of maturity and integrity as have uh, all the other students from both South and North. Uh, so without any, any further questions or commentary, uh, I believe we can move on to the facilities portion of this evening. So Mr. Taylor, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, good evening. Thank you. Um, Matt, you can switch to the next page, please. So I'm going to go over uh, some items quickly tonight. I'm just going to give a facilities update, and then I'm going to move on to um, primarily the custodial RFP process. We can move on, Matt. Thank you. One more. Yeah. So uh, Rolling Hills Elementary School is uh, rolling along. We implemented two weeks ago uh, the COVID-19 preventative measures, and uh, we have a very good system in place. The contractors are stacking on site similar to parent drop-off and uh, being checked in their cars before they're ultimately parking and coming into the site. We have approximately 60 workers um, at that site uh, working uh, hard to get this project uh, completed. And um, we're working on collecting a cost and schedule update from the guys uh, on the impact of the um, stoppage that we had for a short spell and then getting the uh, the wheels turning again as the guys return. So um, I'll have that for you guys shortly. Next slide, Matt. Uh, Sol Feinstein Elementary School, as we're aware, that project has been uh, postponed. However, there's a very small piece of environmental scope that we need to perform in the two-story section of the building and on this plan that you see in front of you, the area that's in gray, um, primarily the first floor level is where we have some minimal work above the ceilings that we're going to take care of uh, this summer uh, before ultimately uh, the return of students. So we will uh, be receiving bids on that uh, later in May and I'll bring those to the board. This is a very small scope, but uh, an important scope nonetheless. Uh, also, um, yeah, this is, these are the, basically the dates. So you can see the environmental bids are due the day of our next board meeting, and then we would bring those to the board in June for further discussions. On the STAR Center, we are working on getting our final approvals in place, uh, working with the township on the land development, the escrow agreement, the stormwater agreement. Uh, the biggest piece of this right now is the sewer planning module, and we are making headway there. Uh, we have a notice to proceed in July. However, we are scheduling a pre-construction meeting with the team, hopefully with the uh, um, Department of Environmental uh, Protection and uh, with um, the county to discuss uh, a potential earlier start if we can, but certainly an administrative start to get the submittals going, the schedule, and, uh, and get all the paperwork moving. So uh, things are going well there. And uh, we're still on track to finish this project next summer uh, so that we can get the students in that building uh, the following school year. So North Turf is in progress. Um, the existing system has been removed. We are down to the stone. They are working on uh, getting the uh, track surface uh, removed, milling the surface off of the track. There is some repairs along the uh, edge that have to be taken care of that we've uncovered as we took the synthetic system off, but that project is moving along uh, very well. These are a couple shots of the Hillcrest and Richboro renderings. We are in the design phase 
of this project. Um, just a couple of shots in. Uh, still working on the uh, ACE grant opportunity for those projects. That decision was originally going to be rendered in May. However, due to the uh, world events, that has been postponed until July. Both of these projects are potential candidates for uh, up to $2 million each. Uh, so we are uh, still hopeful uh, in July that that decision would be rendered that we are uh, in receipt of those grants. So we'll, we'll play it by ear. And these projects, as we've talked about in the past, um, the goal would be if possible and if, if monies allow um, the um, Hillcrest Elementary School project uh, in June of 21 and Richboro Elementary School in June of 22, taking advantage of the former Richboro Middle School as a swing school and, uh, and getting in there sooner than later while the systems are still functioning and we have the opportunity to use it as a swing school. So the last item uh, and probably the most important tonight for me is the custodial services RFP. We did receive five uh, responses to the RFP. Uh, the five folks that responded were all at the mandatory pre-proposal meeting. And um, there's a, a lot to digest uh, with this work. Um, the proposals were around two to 300 pages each from each one of these guys. So there's a lot of information to look at. And I guess, you know, what I would say is, um, and you'll, um, you'll see that there's a three year, uh, three year uh, agreement, which each year it is terminated for convenience. We have that in here as we always have. And as you're aware, we're in the second year of three years for Aramark right now. Uh, but considering uh, a change for, for, uh, uh, for the district. So um, there was an alternate uh, for each one of these guys for the rock block for year two and year three. Uh, those numbers ranged uh, from no dollars to, um, uh, you know, to somewhere around 50,000 uh, or more and paper and soap by the district. So we would provide the paper goods and the soap in lieu of the contractor and the contractors provided for years two and three what the credit would be back to us if we were to do so. Um, and we would have the opportunity, I know we can't make the decision uh, when we award this contract, hopefully on the 21st, to um, you know, make a decision on rock block, but I believe through an amendment in the uh, contract, we could reserve our right to honor these numbers should we make that decision later um, in either case. And I think the vendors would, would be willing to work with us on that. So uh, if you want to move to the next page, uh, next slide, Matt, the recommendations that I'm making are, are based a lot on, I've certainly learned a lot since we put this out to bid several years ago and putting this proposal together, learned a lot from seeing how, um, you know, the services have been administered over the past few years. And certainly before I, I uh, was with the district, the changes that have been made, the reference checks uh, for these uh, these guys, there's budget considerations, which are certainly bigger than ever right now, but at the same time, um, so is cleaning. Uh, cleaning is probably uh, more important than it's ever been in a building uh, based on the world events. So the ability to manage and disinfect for coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 uh, moving forward is going to be key in how that's done. The proposed staffing, the organizational structure of the firms, the staff who is proposed to work with us, how they managing uh, the teams specifically at night, which is important to us. The uh, total proposed full-time equivalents. Uh, I will say that right now we have a, a 68 FTE for the district for cleaning. And I don't believe that that is enough staff. Um, Perhaps, perhaps it could be, depending on how the staff is managed, who the staff is, what the training is, but I believe there needs to be an uptick in the FTEs regardless. Uh, the total proposed annual hours by each one of these companies and the management tools that they offer. So the considerations and recommendation, the baseline information we have in the budget and Bill's confirmed this for next year around, well, it's 2,587,764. So that's what we've had in the budget 
based upon what was planned to be spent uh, next year. Uh, however, we know that um, we're making a change uh, in, either, in either direction. Um, Aramark had requested that the third year of their agreement be modified because they couldn't honor the number that was in the agreement due to um, the challenges that they were facing to meet Apple level two, uh, which is the level of cleanliness that we desire. Um, Apple level one being a hospital and Apple level five being a, a gas station bathroom to give you some perspective on the uh, level of cleanliness. So you'll see two recommendations here. Um, the recommendations, First and foremost, ideally, if, if we had no budget consideration and we weren't uh, dealing with the COVID-19 issues and the challenges of, of cutting budgets, which Bill's going to be speaking about next, I would strongly encourage the consideration of uh, SSC Compass Group, who uh, Compass Group works under, uh, uh, SSC works under Compass Group, which is an umbrella that also carries uh, Chartwells, who we have on board here. Um, However, their proposed fee is about 388,000 higher than our baseline. Again, uh, references were very strong, uh, a very, very good company. Uh, nothing bad to say. I think ideally they would be a perfect fit for us or any district. And, and I heard nothing bad about them in any reference call that I made. Um, in saying that, uh, ABM Industries, uh, References checked out good. Um, they are about 175,000 higher than our baseline. So either one of these will be an impact to our budget and Bill and I uh, and Robert will certainly work together with this budget to carve it out to make this work. Um, certainly this is year one. Uh, in year two and year three, there's also adjustments that would need to be made. And again, I'll work closely uh, with our team to adjust for that. So I will say um, that both of these companies are aware of how I was going to be presenting this tonight. I'm not speaking poorly of, of anyone without um, having had conversation. I believe ABM would be a good fit and an improvement for us. The difference, uh, just so I can explain the difference in cost, SSC has uh, proposed about 85 FTEs and we're at 68. And ABM has proposed about 76 FTE. So the difference in the cost between those two companies has a lot to do with labor and people power. Um, so, you know, that is the big difference. Now, I did uh, prior to the meeting receive a uh, um, message from Compass Group, if the if it's the will of the board uh, to talk to them, uh, that they would be willing to talk about their fee without compromising service. So that's something that, you know, the board would have to be willing for us, me to do if, if you feel that that's ethical or not, that's not a decision that I can make, but um, that was conveyed to me before the meeting. So I think that really from custodial standpoint is a, a you know, brief overview of how it looks and be happy to take questions on, on this piece. All right, Mr. Solomon, before we uh, jump to you to facilitate that discussion, uh, Mr. Taylor, let me just piggyback um, on these last couple items in the context of the I budget. Can't. I'm sorry, Robert, is your speaker on? Is your mic? It is. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, uh, now I can. Okay. Um, so I just want to um, piggyback off of these last two pieces in the context of our budget deficit. So. First, going back to the uh, Hillcrest and Richboro projects, uh, we do not know. I guess I guess this falls into the same category as the textbooks and other instructional resources that Dr. Elliott presented earlier. Um, we, for the time being, are proceeding with with those three instructional resources. We'll know in the next five or six weeks whether we can afford them or not. And and I would say similarly about the Hillcrest and then Richboro project to follow. Um, we're not at a point just yet where we need to suspend those projects because they weren't slated to, uh, to have a shovel in the ground until next summer. So we are continuing with the, de the design phase, engineering phase, and that's work that even if those two projects 
do end up getting suspended, which, which they certainly might, um, it's work that we'll need uh, for once we're able to resume anyway. Um, so, so please know that just because we're talking about those two projects and continuing with these preliminary phases by no stretch, is that any assurance or guarantee or commitment that we're going to, uh, to be able to afford to do those projects on the, uh, the schedule that we currently have them in our long range plan. And so similarly, as we look at this and, and Mr. Taylor has, has explained the, uh, the compass group, uh, has a very a very enticing proposal that they put together, especially with that number uh, of full-time equivalency folks there, the FTE. Um, and yet, because we're in the budgetary situation that we're in, even though we desperately, and I know our teachers and staff desperately wanna see some upgrades, um, just looking at the differential between those two numbers, um, that's a couple hundred thousand plus uh, per year is a lot for us to look past and we're just probably not in a position to look past it. So that's why uh, Mr. Taylor's and our recommendation at this point, short of any other discussion that the board might authorize with Compass Group, our recommendation uh, is with ABM. So with that, Mr. Uh, Seliman, I turn it over to you, please, sir. Hi, good evening. Uh, Doug, I do have a couple of follow-up questions before I uh, turn it over to my fellow colleagues. Um, just looking over the, the numbers that you provided on a slide, uh, probably two slides ago, how did how did they come up with these FTEs? I mean, with, with SSC, they're at 86, and we're looking at ABM with 75.5. Um, um, may not seem like a lot of numbers, I mean, not a people per se, um, but in the world that we're about to enter, the additional cleaners in their mind is needed. So how did, and that's, and this, correct me if I'm wrong, this bid went out before COVID uh, and this is the number that they came back. So I'm, I'm curious to see how, and those numbers are across the board. You have 73, you have 62, 79. How, how do you think they came up with 86? Well, I, I, the guys come up with, the, I'm sorry, hang on. The guys, uh, come up with the numbers, the teams, you know, based upon how they see uh, filling each building, how many hours each day that their staff needs to be at each school to get, get the level of cleanliness, cleanliness uh, specified, um, how they intend to utilize staff. Some will use um, uh, half-time staff, uh, half a day, and, and half, you know, for the other half of the day, um, how they manage uh, evening events, uh, weekend events. There are um, different strategies implemented by the guys, but at the end of the day, each one of these companies is obligated to meet the uh, the APA level two. There are uh, there's a, you know some teeth in this document with some strong penalties if uh, contractors fail uh, to meet the levels that we've asked for after a recovery phase and our ability to retain some dollars uh, to hold them accountable. That's certainly not the way I like to work, but we do have that uh, in the contract should there be any challenges. Um, everyone's aware of that. Um, it's, uh, it's really just a, a strategy and it's uh, you know, a, based on each firm's experience in terms of how they feel best to make this happen. I mean, if you look at Aramark, they, they were at 68. They know the district very well. And uh, Aramark has increased their numbers to uh, 79, almost 80. So Aramark has put their, their numbers around 80. Uh, ABM is around 76. And, uh, and uh, SSC is, you know, the 84 um, range. So all three of those companies are in a, a decent spot. Um, I did have good conversations with ABM. I don't want this to come across as if we're settling for ABM. I, I you know, we, we look for who we feel are good team members and perfect fits for us as teams, you know, Council Rock. And, uh, and I feel good about uh, SSC, but I, I also feel good about ABM and their ability uh, to become a strong part of our team. And they, they have uh, indicated to us a commitment um, the person they're proposing to manage this project is 
uh, actually a, a parent in the district. They've just registered children for school. They're moving into the district. So um, they're definitely gonna have some skin in the game as, as a parent in the district and also uh, someone managing this program on behalf of that company. Uh, so um, again, uh, it really just comes down to, you know, how they feel from a professional fee standpoint, they can make things work. And some have, you know, different hourly rates and can afford to put more people here than others. And I do feel that either one of the companies that are being proposed do have higher hourly rates than are currently being paid, which uh, hopefully uh, brings in some, some folks that maybe are a little more eager to, and, and motivated to, uh, to earn more monies and, and grow in a company. There's also growth opportunity within each of these companies. So um, that's really all I can offer on it, Ed. Okay. And I had just one more after that, only because you brought it up during your presentation. You mentioned that SSC is, is also under the umbrella of Chartwells, I believe you said. And, and there was some conversation you made about uh, maybe talking to them. Legally, are we allowed to go back and, and talk to, to about the numbers they provided? How does that work? Well, I guess I believe Rob Cox is on this. Uh, on this, uh, is he in this meeting still? Is he gone at this point? I think he's under participant. Um, yeah, because no, you know, again, it's a professional service. It's not a, a bid, so we have the ability. But there's different feelings that uh, each person may have relative to revisiting something like that. I, the last thing I would do is revisit and reduce the scope for one person versus what the other scope would be. So if anyone you know, is talking about uh, dealing with fees, it couldn't be by changing the scope of theirs to, you know, uh, without giving the same opportunity to someone else. It would have to be um, honoring the same requirements that, those, that the contract documents uh, require. But I would have to defer to Rob if he's willing to comment on that. Uh, Rob is no longer on the call. Okay. So if there's an interest in that, I could certainly reach out to our, you know, solicitor and ask him if, if the board wants me to. If not, I respect that as well. Okay, thanks, Doug. Uh, I see that uh, Mrs. Marcel has her hand up. Thanks, Mr. Fallon. Um, I would be interested in knowing the answer to that question as well. Uh, obviously, other board members can chime in on that one. But um, my, my question, uh, Mr. Taylor, is um, I was wondering if you could share uh, examples. Obviously, we're familiar with Airmark, but if you could share examples of clients that um, these other two companies have in terms of the types of accounts, you know, the types of um, are, are they servicing schools or hospitals or, um, you know, because uh, obviously cost is really important from my perspective, but I also really want to make sure that um, we're working with a really solid and strong partner in this area, given the complexities and challenges that we're going to be facing um, going forward. So if you could share that, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Sure, and I can share uh, some hard copy information with you guys as relative to the references, but ABM has Lehigh University. Uh, they've been there for 25 years or 20 years. They've been there a long time. Uh, school District of Lancaster, which is a district similar to our size, Widener University, um, and several other universities. Um, I, can, I can share that. Uh, SSC has probably a more extensive list from what I've seen of school experience Quakertown Community School District, Garnet Valley. Um, and they have a lot of Southern uh, school districts. They're based out of Tennessee, but the representatives that would work for us um, would be in our area. They do have uh, you know, representatives uh, in our area and will relocate uh, local presence if they were awarded the contract. ABM is out of Philadelphia. Um, so they have a more localized office, but they would still be uh, putting someone in our district to manage this uh, contract. But I, I will share with, uh, with the board a more extensive list of contacts, or uh, uh, client uh, references. Mr. Taylor, I heard you mention my name. This is Rob Cox, but I didn't quite catch the question or the context of it. 
Yeah, Rob, if, if I don't want to put you on the spot, so if you want to talk to me tomorrow, that's fine. Um, the question is that as a professional service, if, if, a, uh, if one of the firms wanted to discuss a potential adjustment of fee, is that something that is um, that could be considered? I think that it probably is, Doug. It, it, um, we need to go over the specs um, and we need to talk through the context a bit, but certainly the district has more flexibility uh, where it is evaluating an RFP for professional service than it does on a bid for, you know, school construction or supplies. So potentially that is an option. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Marcel, are you, are you have any more questions? Are you good? Thank you. Okay. All right, I also see Dr. Thorwart, your hands up as well, Mike. Yes, it is. Um, I just wanted to, um, I want to reiterate and confirm with Doug that I heard it. Um, as we move forward here, we need these schools to be clean. Um, if nothing else, these past couple of months have, have demonstrated that. So if we are unhappy, I, I just wanted to make sure I heard correctly. We can back out of this contract with um, limited notice. Is, is that right, Doug? We do, uh, we do have uh, the ability to, um, to back out of a, of a contract. Normally we don't back out you know, within months of awarding, um, but I think that we have that ability to do so. Um, there's certainly going to be a transition phase and, and an acclimation process, which I think will have to be fair with anyone that comes on board, but agreed. I, I was very clear with Specifically with the final two that I see as the as the competitors, um, ABM and SSC, both are geared up for uh, COVID-19 precautions. Both will do, you know, high touch surfaces every day in the schools. Um, both are very uh, experienced in managing this. Their clients have mentioned that they have not come back and asked for additional fees as a result of managing COVID-19 in their schools. And um, they both have plans for uh, students returning to school and how they're going to manage, um, you know, uh, at least what we know today, as right. far as cleaning and making sure buildings are disinfected and safe for staff, students, and visitors. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and Mike, and to your point, that that's why I was asking about the difference in the full-time equivalents with with SSC offering that you know a couple more bodies but every every extra body will help do the job that they're being paid to do so it's a lot more high touch surfaces then yes I well agree. yeah and I, you know I know we're looking at costs and, and and we always have to worry about costs but that number when I'm looking through the grid just jumps out at me and and uh, I thought it was an important question to have uh, I see Mrs. Brooks your hands is up please join us uh, just a question, and apologies if I missed it. Do we have to vote on this in May? Yes, we we really need to um, to get someone on board as quickly as possible to onboard a team so that we are ready to, uh, you know, Aramark would have to help transition uh, this company. And I, I've heard positives from clients who worked with Aramark who actually had um, a transitioning phase, uh, similar to what we're going to likely be working through, um, where um, we're going to need all of uh, June, July, and, and August to ready the buildings uh, for kids. Uh, normally, we need that just for, you know, moving furniture, waxing floors, getting spaces ready. Aramark has been very helpful in working with us uh, to get uh, buildings ready. Their waxing floors are doing what they need to do. Uh, as if, uh, you know, kids were, um, you know, returning from summer break. So about half the schools will be finished before a new company comes on board, but, but they're going to have to go into every custodial closet in each school and take out, you know, um, Aramark will take their equipment out. The new provider will be installing their equipment, their chemical stations. There's a lot of work to do, meeting with principals, getting to know the team here. Um, so yes. And uh, as with any company, there'll be attrition from people we have. They'll want to try to, you know, work with 
some of the folks, I, I know Aramark won't want to see all their workers put on the street. So they would work together with uh, an incoming company to try to, you know, keep their employees gainfully employed um, with the district, those that are qualified and meet the intent, you know, meet the requirements of whoever the company is that comes on. So from a process standpoint, though, um, knowing that we're two weeks away from the meeting, I mean, is there time for you? Like, what would this look like if you were to review the details of this with Rob, understand how you might approach going back to SSC? Um, and then is it just, you know, we'll bring it back for a discussion to see where we stand two weeks from now? Uh, like, I, I'm just not clear on how, you know, is there enough time to actually do what you may want to do and how do we get that information to understand where it all lands? Because the, the thing that's weird about this, you know, of course, is like, you know, your instinct is to always go with the lowest bidder, right? But if this isn't apples to apples because they're not providing exactly the same um, services and not, not the same numbers of, of FTEs. So, you know, there there is some latitude here. So I'm just trying to understand what happens, how this works over the next two weeks. So the low the low bidder I didn't even mention um, is actually proposing 62 FTEs. So they're six less than we currently have, and um, I, I don't see that that can work at all uh, based on what we've experienced and what we know. Um, but to answer your question, I, I would probably uh, take care of a good bit of this tomorrow in terms of talking to Rob, pending he's available, and, and moving forward with having those discussions so that I'm not leaving people, uh, the companies hanging out there uh, too long. And I think there'd be time to, to do that research and still get something back into the board's hand via, you know, an email to the entire board um, prior to our board meeting. So you understand what, what is being considered and recommended before that next board meeting. Okay, thanks. I mean, uh, certainly for me, the, the number of employees that they're providing to this is so critical now more than ever. Um, but, you know, we still have a finance portion of this to go and these costs, you know, every, every bit counts obviously for all of us. So um, thanks in advance for the work on that. You're welcome. And Doug, I just have one more, one more for clarification purposes. When we put this RFP out, Give me the timeline and did this uh, have a COVID slant on it at all? Or are we going to be talking about implementing that as we move into whatever we move into moving forward? I'm sorry, I missed the very beginning of that, Ed. I said when we when you sent this out initially, I don't believe we were in the state we are in now or, or even back then. It was even not even being discussed COVID in general. Does this RFP include the additional things that we may think we may see? Do we have to add an addendum to it if we have to add things? Um, and, and, and if not, that and then I would say that definitely should be part of your conversation. If you go back to them, you know, the extra touch points and, and the other, you know, wipe downs in areas that we think we may need to see it. So that's a very good question. And this did go out to bid uh, right before, you know, we were shut down, but we certainly were aware that there was a virus lurking. No one knew to what extent it would uh, turn into. Um, we uh, temporarily suspended the process and then it was apparent we wouldn't be returning and I wouldn't be able to have a meeting, you know, in the district and have people drive around and look at every school and do the things they wanted to do. So we, uh, we went back through and, and started the process over. Um, we issued a, a document that has a spreadsheet that shows the general finishes in every school. They're fully aware of uh, what the buildings uh, feel like based on their experience, what the major finishes are in every building. And it does include language uh, relative to COVID-19, um, precautions and cleaning and complying with CDC and other governmental agencies, uh, you know, OSHA and whatever recommendations are out there. It also addresses the force majeure issue and that uh, COVID-19, uh, at least in this contract, can't be considered force majeure because it's a known virus now. So that's not something that we're going to exclude. 
uh, from this contract. And both of these vendors are fully on board with uh, disinfecting daily and doing everything that we know as of the submission of their numbers to us uh, relative to CDC and, and OSHA. So um, I believe that we have that covered in these numbers. Thanks for clarifying that. I think it's important for those that are listening and us as we move forward to make this decision that that, that we, we address that head on going into whatever the next several months or the year looks like it's going to be like. Uh, Mr. Block, I saw that your hand was up earlier. It's now down. I assume you don't have a question. No, uh, they were answered. Thank you. Okay, great. Anybody else at this point? And I would just ask if uh, if the board would like me to to reach out to SSC. I just want to make sure I do have that support before I go on that uh, path. I wouldn't want to do that without the support of the board. Doug, you have my support. Absolutely. That number to me jumped off the page. I'm interested to see uh, with our relationship with Chartwells uh, and them being a part of that umbrella, if, if there's any any movement in that number. Um, and I'm looking forward to hear what they're willing to do. I'm good, Doug. I'd be okay with both of them, actually. Yep. I'm yes, agree. Okay. Thank you, guys. I'm I in. Thank you. Yeah, I'm in. All right, fantastic. Thanks, Mr. Taylor. Thanks, Mr. Solomon. Uh, Ms. O'Grady, do we have any public comment on facilities? I'm, I'm sorry, Robert. I have one more item. I'm oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, just, just go. So we will. I will bring to you on the 21st uh, what's recommended, but there will be information shared with the board prior to this meeting. And one more slide. The KVK extension will also be on the next uh, on the board agenda. We have. Uh, uh, realize the benefits of that agreement from 2015 to 2020. Um, that is set to expire. I've worked with Rob. I've worked with KVK relative to discussions on extending this um, under the same terms. Everyone seems to feel that that is uh, a good, um, good for both parties. It would provide us with another five years of conditioned storage space of 8,000 square feet that we share over in Warminster. Um, they would continue to partner with the Education Foundation, and we would, you know, share these benefits through 2025. That is all I have. Thank you, guys. All right. Any questions or comments on that before we look to Susan O'Grady? All right, thanks, Mr. Taylor. Sorry for cutting you off. No, I'm sorry, thank you. All right, Ms. O'Grady, do we have any public comment on uh, facilities for this evening? We do. Uh, the first is from Christine Crocker. Um, Christine resides in the Holland area. And uh, she writes, thank you for reading and listening to the comments sent in by the CR families during the last meeting. Based on what I heard at the last meeting, I had some additional comments. Andy Block was correct in saying, the decision is not about North versus South. This is not a North versus South issue. The public comments are trying to address the consistent bias decision-making of the board on how the money from the school budget is used to address the needs of North, not South. The disparity between the two school districts is growing and becoming more evident between the communities. During the meeting, the board stated they were presented with the budget the week before and saw a significant deficit in the finances. Even after seeing the deficit, the board still decided to move forward with not only returfing North, but also resurfacing the track, a new scoreboard and safety netting at both ends of the field. When the two new middle schools were built, the board made sure Newtown Middle had safe grass field where the students could have home games. This was not done for Holland Middle School. It's been three years and the students are still not allowed to practice or play on the new football field due to safety concerns. Therefore, the HMS football team must practice on an old softball field. And once again, they are a guest for every single game. After last month's meeting, my son said, I'm bummed that I will always be considered the guest when playing for my own school. I wish we could have a home field of our own to play on. 
I didn't know how to respond because my son will never have the experience of playing a home game while attending Council Rock Middle or High School. Through your decision making, the board has taught the South students some important lessons. One, actions speak louder than words. Two, leaders can make biased decisions. Three, people sometimes determine your importance based on things you may be un unable to control, such as your zip code. I know the third bullet may sound harsh and you may be shaking your head, but please understand because of the decisions you have made over time, you have created a disparity between the two districts. You've set the president that North students are more important than South students. Each time you make decisions favoring North, this reinforces the message until it has become a reality to the South families. As the students get older, they begin to see the disparity and understand the message that's being delivered along with your decision. The message of disparity was evident in all the emails you've received from the CRSD community at the last meeting. I know these are unprecedented times and COVID has challenged each of us financially, emotionally, or mentally, et cetera. I understand the board's decision to suspend all capital projects due to this financial situation. I would like to trust the board that when you say turfing South is our top priority, once thing the, bu the budget gets better, but the board has shown the South students and families that we are unable to trust you to follow through on your commitments. Our fear is that another project will come up, which always does, and returfing South will be put to the side again, and we will still be fighting for the turf for years to come. It is crucial the board take actions to reduce the disparity in the school community. Our children feel the impact of your decisions it must be a priority of the CR South High School as soon as the budget allows. Unfortunately for right now, the South students will continue to remain a guest in their own school district. Our second public comment is from Stuart Mickelberg, who resides in the Richborough area of the township. I have two daughters who will both attend Council Rock South High School in the future. First, I would like to start off that I think it is an absolute disgrace that we are in this position when it comes to a turf at CR South. It is a disgrace that when CR South was built, that it was built without a stadium and without a turf field comparable to the one that exists at CR North. It is a disgrace that CR South was built without a pool like the one at CR North. It is a disgrace that during the roughly 18 years since Council Rock High School opened, no turf field or stadium was ever approved and built and let's not forget that many of those 18 years were what we consider a good economic time. Lastly, it is a disgrace that only a few short months after approving a turf field, this board citing economic uncertainty has decided to indefinitely postpone the turf field at CR South. While I understand the economic reality that we are all facing and the difficulties in improving capital projects in financial uncertain times, there are things this board can do right now to demonstrate its commitment to build a turf field and stadium at CR South. With that said, I respectfully ask this board to immediately set an economic benchmark of some sort and commit to the community that upon reaching that benchmark, the board will approve both the stadium and a turf field for CR South. In the meantime, until a full stadium and turf field is built at CR South, immediate measures should be put in place to ensure full and equal access for both CR South students and CR North students to the stadium and turf field at CR North. It should be the policy of this school district that for as long as there are two high schools and one stadium with turf, that no one high school should have the priority all the time to the facility. It needs to be shared in an equitable manner between the schools. Our third public comment comes from Aiden Guest, CR South class of 2021, Aiden resides in the Richborough area and writes, the fact that Council Rock South, School South student athletes have to play their home games at Council Rock North is beyond embarrassing for the South athletic teams, but it should also be an embarrassment for the board members as well. Being a South football player, I'm sure that my teammates and other sports teams that represent our school feel the same exact way about how embarrassing it is. We are the only school in this area that doesn't have a stadium with turf. The board members, in my opinion, should have more of concern about the disparities between the two high schools. Stop making excuses and get it done. 
Our final comment comes from Lauren Smith, see ourselves class of 2021, and Lauren resides in the Holland area. She writes, I am a current 11th grader and a multi-sport athlete at Council Rock High School South. I also play for a club soccer team that utilizes the turf at CR North more than once a week. For both of the sports I participate in at CR South, my coaches have to almost fight over turf time with not only the other teams participating at South, but the ones at North as well. When we are able to get time on the turf, it is usually at an inconvenient time for the majority of the players on the team. The rain last fall impacted the soccer fields at South since the rain runs directly off of the basketball courts onto the soccer field. The JV team did not get to play half of their scheduled games because they were canceled and varsity had to reschedule to play their games either away or at North. This would not be a problem if CR South had a turf. The Council Rock South community deserves to have a field to call their own. The athletes at South deserve the opportunity to have a senior night of their own turf at their own school, not at North. If schools were still open and spring sports seasons were taking place, both schools would still be utilizing the turf at North as well as the school board. Putting in turf at South would benefit the Council Rock community as a whole by giving the students at South an equal opportunity to prepare for their sports seasons and having not one, but two facilities to be used at once. I would hope that the school board respects the previous passing of the turf at South and takes the voices of the Council Rock South community into consideration when voting in favor of a turf field at CR South. And that concludes our public comments for facility relative comments. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. O'Grady. Very much appreciated and very much appreciate uh, the folks that provided that public comment on the CR South turf. Um, I do just wanna quickly reiterate um, a point that I made in a communication that I sent out, uh, I believe it was last Saturday over the weekend. And that was really just to reiterate what I heard from this school board a couple weeks ago. And that is that this project is important to us. Um, there is a recognition from this board, from myself, uh, that, that we do have a lack of parity uh, between the two high schools, uh, in particular when it comes to, to this issue. And uh, we are fully committed, um, is what I heard and what you all heard, uh, to making sure this South does have a turf field. Uh, and we look forward to that happening sooner than later. Uh, there are many, many unknowns with this economy, and it's really unfortunate because our, our friends on the, the south side of the district have been waiting for a long time for this. Finally, it was coming to fruition, and unfortunately, we have this, this pandemic um, that is not only wrecking havoc from a health standpoint, but from an economic standpoint as well. Um, it will stay on the radar. It um, will be discussed on a regular basis um, every fall and again uh, during uh, budget process. Um, and uh, certainly the, the intent, the desire, and the commitment is there from myself as superintendent and from the majority of the board that I heard from two weeks ago on this topic. And I know that nothing has changed since then uh, for any of them. So, so please know that and uh, your day most definitely is coming. Um, don't know when, but again, hopefully sooner than later. Uh, Mr. Taylor, thank you. Okay, moving on to budget uh, and Mr. Stone, the floor is yours. Okay, right, thank you, Dr. Frazier. Let's take a moment to transition to share the screen. All right, so good evening, board members, community. Uh, tonight, we have a few topics of uh, discussion before we get into the into the budget uh, into the budget discussion um, and these are all these will all be uh, consent agenda items uh, on the May 21st board agenda so we have a few bids and we have a discussion about a renewal contract with Chartwells for our food service uh, operation. So we have three bids before you here this evening. Um, these bids are the mechanism for the majority of our purchasing that happens during the year. So 
Uh, these are the quantities get adjusted during the budget process. So you see an amount awarded here uh, on this uh, on this table that's based on what was put out to bid and is very much subject to approval of, of the final budget and is at the discretion of the various uh, building administrators and uh, Dr. Elliott and the curriculum coordinators. So you, you can take these numbers um, as a general guideline of what we anticipate spending, but it is within the, the framework of an overall uh, budget, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes. Um, uh, the phys ed bid is about is a status quo bid from last year, very similar in terms of dollar amount. Uh, the science bid, there were a few additional probes and sensors in this year's bid that were not ordered last year, which is accounting for that, uh, that increase. And in the uh, tech ed bid, uh, we are uh, look. We see a couple of uh, larger pieces of equipment, um, digital cameras for our photography courses, uh, a transparent engine for our auto shop classes, and a vacuum forming machine. Um, so the, those three bids we will uh, put forward uh, for consideration on May 21st. We will also have a few other bids that uh, just by the nature of the timing and in this virtual environment we're not able to be open and put on the agenda for tonight's uh, for tonight's meeting, but uh, we will have uh, approvals for the art bid and the music bid uh, at the next board meeting. And we will also have uh, the results of a of an RFP for our copiers. Our, our most recent lease is expiring at the end of this year. And much like we did with custodial services, we also have an RFP out for copiers. And we hope to uh, see some savings as a result of that. Uh, we also, this is a, another bid, but just requires a little bit more uh, explanation. This was a, a bid for our student planners, which are used at, at, both, uh, at both the elementary and secondary levels in, in different forms. And you think of these as your assignment books that each student is, is given. Um, the last RFP for these uh, student planners was in 2018, and it was a two-year uh, two term. Uh, we were pleased with the way that worked out as far as the, the, the vendor and the process. So we are recommending to continue that process, but this time we are asking for a three-year agreement, uh, which would cover the next three school years. Um, we are recommending, uh, this is a split award, so we're recommending that schoolmate be awarded the elementary uh, assignment books and that entourage yearbooks be awarded the, uh, the secondary school um, planners, so both the middle schools and the high schools. Uh, based on the prices that we received in the in the initial RFP in 2018, we're estimating savings from from this uh, particular exercise of about $13,000 over the life of the uh, three-year term. At the, and at the elementary school level, uh, these these uh, books are paid in in. Major in the majority of schools and in the uh, in the majority of the dollars paid by the PTOs at the secondary schools, these are accounted for in the in the building budgets. Um, so before I move on, uh, Ms. Marcel, would you like to take questions, or should I uh, wait until after I do the uh, the last item and take all the non-budget questions at that time? I think we could. I'm sorry, Kristen. Did you want to jump in? I think we could take. No, it. I just wanted to see Mark if you wanted to help. Um, Mr. Stone. Yeah, no problem. Um, I, I think we can wait until the end, Bill. Uh, if, okay. Or if anyone has anything pressing, they can raise their hand, but I think everybody can probably wait till the end. Very good. So then the last item before we move into the budget is a recommendation to renew the food service management company with, uh, with Chartwells. Uh, we discussed this item back in uh, at the March Finance Committee meeting, uh, and we are making the recommendation to renew for one year with Chartwells based on a couple of factors. The first is that over the, the last couple of months, we have seen improved performance in, uh, in meal quality and in, in their financials. And we believe that in a non-COVID-19 environment, that, that performance could, could continue. Um, We've also been out to RFP very recently, last year, and it's a highly regulated process by the state. And I think that we would likely, in, in this environment, face a, a pretty non-competitive environment just for the sake of uh, not being able to have other vendors come through and, and view our cafeterias and view our serving lines. 
which is very important in the, the way that they're able to design their menus and their marketing, uh, which is really what drives their ability to raise revenue and therefore um, controls what we would pay in, in cost. So given that we've had a very current RFP and that th this, this environment just is not conducive to, to a, very, um, a, a very good process for RFP, we're, we're, we are recommending to exercise the first of five renewals that uh, is permitted by contract uh, that was approved by the board last year when we when we completed this RFP and it is just a one year renewal. This will have to be revisited uh, each year and and around this time next year. So those are the uh, the board agenda items, um, and I'll I'll be happy to take questions on those before we move into budget if there are any. Okay. If you have a question, raise your hand and we'll um, have those questions for Bill. Okay, not seeing any, let's move forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're gonna talk about three things related to the, to the budget. We're going to look at uh, where I believe based on current information that we will finish the, the this fiscal year 2019-20 and then we'll transition into uh, the next year budget development for 2021 and, and talk about the, the reductions that have been made in the budget already based on the information that you've, that you've seen over the last couple of months. And, and then after we conclude that, we'll, we'll shift into the financial planning module uh, synopsis and I will show how the, um, how the COVID-19 pandemic is impacting not only just this year's financial situation, but also how it will impact us in future years, because we do anticipate that this is not just a, uh, a one year, one year issue that, that we're going to face. We, we believe that there will be long term implications of, uh, of this uh, closure. All right, so uh, moving into the current year estimate. So what, what, what you're seeing here in this first column is what we budgeted for 2019-2020. And we had initially estimated a, a deficit of $4.4 million. This was similar to what we had budgeted in, in the last several, several years. And it, of course, was based on economic circumstances uh, pre, pre COVID 19. So we anticipated uh, through conservative budgeting to be able to finish uh, favorable with revenue and favorable on expenditures and thereby eliminate that budget deficit. Um, I'm happy to, to say that. Um, we are estimating uh, right now a very small surplus, and this is probably the best case scenario for us. Uh, so you can see that the, the estimated figures indicate that we would finish about four hundred twenty-five thousand uh, dollars in the positive, which is which is really which is really good. But I think it, it highlights a few things here: is that we are beginning to see the the long-term revenue declines as a result of the recession from, from closing, uh, closing the economy, closing schools. And you're also seeing the impact of deficit budgeting. And I'll, and I'll demonstrate that quickly here. So our, our, I'm anticipating that our revenue is going to finish $2.7 million under budget. And this, just for the sake of some history, in the last couple of years, we've finished, instead of minus 1.1%, we've finished plus 1%, and sometimes even more. Um, so we, instead of hitting that revenue target, we, we are not going to, to, to make that number. That's due to uh, a couple of items. The, the major issue here is obviously in local revenue, a decline of, of about $3.6 million. That is primarily due to earned income taxes. And, and what's happening with earned income taxes, as I think most people are aware, the uh, federal, state, and local governments delayed the filing of, uh, of income taxes, which normally would be April 15th. The deadline was extended to July 15th. So what that three month delay does is it takes us from this fiscal year, 2019-20 and shifts the collection of funds into 2021. So we normally in, under, uh, under normal circumstances, we see about 20% of our earned income tax revenue be collected in the month of May because that filing deadline is April 15th and returns get processed and funds are remitted. But now with a July 15th filing deadline, we do not anticipate seeing those funds until August, which is, this exacerbates the, the uncertainty of making financial projections because 
we will not be able to see whether or not the, the pandemic has had a, a major impact on salaries and the amount of collections that we're receiving. I'm certain that we are not going to collect as much money because of that filing deadline delay. It certainly behooves anyone um, to, to wait as long as possible to file their uh, to file their earned income tax return if they have that if they have that option. Um, so that shift of funds is is going to is going to create the majority of that hole. It's about 2.3 million dollars. Um, you know, just for some context, we did collect the majority of our uh, real estate tax revenue. We could collect that before uh, before the new year, the, the calendar new year. Um, so that did come in a little bit higher than anticipated, which is helping to offset some of those losses. But our interim real estate taxes and our delinquent taxes are lagging. So that's what's contributing to the remainder of that $3.6 million. On the expenditure side of the budget, we are anticipating to see savings of about $7.6 million or 3%. This is significantly higher than what we would normally anticipate. And that's primarily in what we call the 300 to 900 objects. These are the services, supplies, and equipment that we purchase in our budget. Um, the salaries and benefits are finishing similar to what we would normally see. The reason for that is there is a, a contractual or excuse me, a, a, a state mandate to continue to pay salaries and benefits uh, at the same level as were um, as were to be paid before the pandemic hit. So we are just seeing some some minor savings and substitute overtime costs as well as just the impact of our of our normal conservative budgeting process there. Um, but in the 300 to 900 objects, you know, an, an original budget of 57.7 million, now anticipated to be 51.4 million dollars. There are a few items that are contributing to that. The, the main, the main contributor is uh, the payments that are not being made to first student, um, who provides the majority of our transportation operation and the associated savings from not utilizing propane. Uh, so that is the, the, the most significant new factor that, that we bring into this analysis here. Um, we see modest savings from the, the early shutdown of the budgets and the less, you know, the, we are not using quite as much energy as normal because the buildings are not fully occupied. We are saving on per diem substitute costs because we are not in, in school and uh, needing those substitutes to, to come into the building. So, that this this is the what I want to show is that is the impact of that of, of this deficit budgeting model and how it exacerbates this issue this, this issue that we're facing. So we were planning on 4.4 million dollars and hoped that this number here would be plus one percent. This number here would be minus one percent. So even in an environment when we see a minus three percent on our expenditures, as soon as that revenue went in the went in the wrong direction. We, we have a very difficult time making up the difference. And so it's, it's very unusual to see a 3% savings on your budget and not seeing a more significant surplus come in. So that, um, that's a, something that to keep in mind as we start to think ahead towards the planning for, for 2021 and beyond. So I'll move on into uh, the 2021 budget. So this, as as you uh, just acted of, of no, I'm sorry. Can we, uh, can we just hold up there for a second? So of course. that you just said a lot there, and I just want to pause to see if anyone has any questions about anything that you presented there. Okay, and I I don't see anybody. I'd like to just make a quick comment for or ask you about clarification for something sure. or with something. So. The $3.5 million difference that comes, majority of it in EIT, I'm feeling like, and I think we might have discussed this on our call earlier, but I'm feeling like that's that's going to exacerbate the issue with um, not giving us a true look at the effect for the budget going into next year. Because if, if we have if we have the collections, um, you know, a significant amount of collections for our next fiscal, fiscal year budget, they'll be based off of last year's individual revenues, right? Individual revenues like um, people's earnings. Yes. Um, so we should see a pretty high collection rate, but it's the next year that we're really potentially going to get hammered. Um, so yes. do you think, yeah, do you, am I thinking in the right way? Or are we, are we really going to kind of just delaying the pain one more year um, by having this pushed into the next fiscal year? 
we, I, I believe that we, we are, um, I, what's going to happen is that we're, we will finish this year with less revenue and we'll see, I do think we'll see an uptick early in the year, early in next fiscal year because of the returns that are now being filed three months later than usual. Right. And only until that point will we be able to do a true comparison of the final returns for the, for the fiscal year and be able to determine whether there was a revenue loss due to unemployment, salary decreases and things of those nature. So we're, we're going to approve a budget at the end of June and then two months later, we're gonna be able to analyze the impact of, of earned income tax. So on two fronts, we need to be prepared. One, if those numbers come in less than anticipated, then we need to be prepared to act swiftly with um, expenditure reductions to make sure that our budget doesn't get too far out of whack. But then we also need to revisit the, the projections that are made for uh, 2020, 21, 22 and beyond, because those are right now based on the unknown of, of the, of the pandemic. Uh, so yes, it's, it's going to, it, it prolongs the uncertainty most, most certainly. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I don't see anyone else. So I think we can move on. Thank you. Okay. All right, so what I'm going to do here, as I, as I was mentioning, the, the board just approved in a, a perfunctory fashion the, the proposed final budget, which uh, gives us now, we have about five weeks until the, the final budget gets approved, which does, <clears throat> excuse me, establish the spending plan and the real estate tax rate for next year. So right now, we are at a remaining budget deficit of just under $6 million from the, from the work that has been done thus far. Um, so on the left side column here, what you're seeing is our starting point for revenues. This was the first draft that was seen in March, again, pre-pandemic closure. Um, we had an assumption in that preliminary budget of a 3.1% real estate tax increase, and the board should recall discussion around uh, this is the 3.1% is, is calculated based on 2.6% as the base Act 1 index and a half a percent which is for an ex uh, the real estate tax exception for um, special education expenditures. So that's uh, about uh, just under $5 million of additional revenue that's, that's built into this projection. So these local revenue changes, we discussed these in detail last month. Um, these numbers did not, did not change. They are the same uh, projections that I had in, in before, um, but you're seeing declines for the most part in our in our local revenue because of the impact of the of the pandemic. What's new that you're seeing on the revenue side is the this impact of the transportation subsidy minus $510,000. That is because of the fact that we are not uh, providing transportation services for the last 60 days of this school year that we are currently in and the state pays that subsidy in arrears, which means we get paid for this year's transportation subsidy in next year's budget. So we are, because of that non-payment, going to see a decline in our transportation subsidy. And then related to our uh, savings from retirements and resignations that I'll talk about in just a moment, we do see a, a decrease in our revenue because that is a reimbursement from the state for our fringe benefits, social security and retirement. Those, uh, the, we get 50% uh, reimbursement from the state on those costs. Uh, so it's a net a, a net savings against uh, what we see on the expenditure side. So on the expenditure side, what, what we're going to do is uh, I will I'll share first with you that we have received 29.7 retirements or resignations, which is contributing about $1.9 million. And that's calculated as the net of this $2.2 million of reductions on the expenditure side plus these two subsidy reimbursements here, or minus these two subsidy reimbursements, excuse me. So that number is a bit higher than what we typically anticipate. We usually uh, expect to see somewhere in the neighborhood of 20, um, but again, with the, the, the delayed deadline and perhaps the impact of the pandemic, we did see more retirements than, than anticipated. So it's, a, it's, it's at this point in the, in the presentation that I will uh, get a little help from my friends from uh, from the cabinet team to review their department reductions in, in more detail. But I'll, I'll, I'll share just very briefly, we've come to, come to this meeting uh, prepared to make $3.3 million of 
budget reductions uh, in what we call our department budgets. And again, these are primarily in the 300 to 900 objects. So the services, supplies, and equipment that are uh, used in our, in our schools. Um, they, do, they do not reflect any changes in programming. They do not reflect any changes in, in, in staffing levels. Um, but what you can see in these last two columns here, and in particular, this, this, this column that I'm highlighting here, is the percentage that the department reduced its budget. And you can see some pretty, pretty high numbers here. The average reductions come in at 15%. So it's fair to say that in general, this, the, the members of, of my team have contributed, uh, the members of our team have contributed 15% reductions already to, to this budget process, and we still have a $6 million deficit to go. So there is still work to be done, and we need to continue to look at the budget in a lot of different ways to find more reductions to be able to uh, eliminate that budget deficit. So we are gonna go in, uh, in the order that you see here, uh, in terms of uh, the cabinet members presenting. So um, I will um, turn it over to Mr. Taylor to begin. And then if everybody can just uh, on the cabinet team can just follow right after him when he completes uh, his reductions, uh, we'll, we'll pause once Ms. O'Grady completes hers and takes some questions on uh, the 2021 budget. I'm sorry, Bill, Bill and Mark, do you mind if I just ask one question given you just put up a big number in blue? Go right ahead. Um, I, I'm just going to ask a provocative question to give people a feel for how big that number is. Um, could you tell me roughly how many FTEs that might represent uh, and or what we spend in totality on our extracurriculars? I don't know if you're able to answer those, that, that second question if you're not. I'm just trying to give people a, a, a sense for the enormity uh, of our situation given the, the cuts you've already made. Yeah, so I think that we probably are looking at about 60 uh, professional FTEs um, for that remaining budget deficit um, at a, let me make sure I do that math right here. Doesn't have to be perfect, obviously. It's about, it's about 60 FTEs. Um, I do not know the uh, impact on uh, extracurriculars off the top of my head, but I do believe that that is more than the total amount that we spend on um, all extracurricular activities, um, including coaches' salaries and, and officials and, and uniforms, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, yeah. uh, we got Ed uh, Tate had his hands up, hand up. Uh, unmute yourself, Ed. Okay, why don't we go to Joe while Ed's working that out? Then. Okay, it, thank you. I think, uh, Bill, I just wanted to double check on the number of the 2.275 million uh, for the FTE of 29.7. Uh, that's like 70. $76,000. I'm wondering, you know, wouldn't it be a bigger number than that? So that, that number, Mr. Hidalgo, shows the difference between the retiring employee and the employee that is replacing that employee. So a, a, an employee a typically number. retires from the top of the schedule and is replaced by, by an employee at the bottom of the schedule or closer Perfect. to the bottom of the schedule. So there's a a natural savings when when that replacement occurs. So that's what that difference represents. That's exactly. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. You're welcome. Thanks, Joe. Ed, do you still have a question, Ed? Ed Tate? That was essentially the question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Bill, can I just get clarification here? So uh, the percentage of total budget, you referenced 15%. Uh, so I'm reading that as 0.15%. So I'm reading that wrong. That's... Uh, the, yeah, so the, the, the way I calculated that was I took the average of these, uh, these uh, numbers here in oh, the percentage of department budgets. Yeah, so that's just an average, you know, range of seven to as high as uh, almost 26%. Understood. The, I, I actually missed that for some reason. The uh, percentage of department budget, percentage of total budget. That makes sense. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, I think you can move on. Thank you. Okay, very good. Thank you. So just the last item before we transition into the uh, into the synopsis mm -hmm. model is the uh, budget timeline. So we just have two remaining actions. Um, at... Sorry, Mr. Yeah. Sen. I think uh, we still want our uh, cabinet compadres to go through. Oh, you're uh, right. I'm so, I'm so sorry. I, I got ahead of myself. Still we threw you. <laughs> yeah. Forgive me, Mr. Taylor. Okay, sure. Um, so the one one point two million uh, is a combination of deferred security upgrades, and when we say deferred security upgrades, that doesn't mean we're making our current security uh, less secure or unsafe. These are enhancements to the security system that we already have in place. So I, I want to be clear that we're not putting the district at risk by not spending this money, but it is money to enhance uh, what we have in place, and that is. Uh, about $736,000 roughly of the 1.2 million. In addition, um, we're reducing the allocation uh, to purchase new equipment in schools. Um, for example, um, uh, you get a call that there's um, non-environmentally um, hazardous odiferous carpet. So we'll go into the, the building and, and uh, take out carpet in one or two classrooms and replace it perhaps during the school year. Um, uh, that can happen across several schools. Um, things such as that, uh, equipment that isn't uh, non, it's non-emergency related uh, equipment replacement that, that's getting tired that we might be more proactive in replacing, things of that sort. That's about $405,000 of the 1.2. And lastly, um, our vehicle uh, replacement program, uh, we would defer the replacement of a vehicle for at least a year, uh, depending on where things land next year. So that would be another $80,000. So that's the uh, nutshell of the 1.2 million for operations. In the technology category, uh, the bulk of that money would be used to replace laptops, desktops, and other computer equipment in the district that are due for on the refresh cycle to be replaced. Uh, it also includes uh, replacements for some of the back-end equipment, servers, storage, uh, which is pushing 10 years. And also it would delay the implementation of some of our cybersecurity initiatives, um, which is basically be automating some manual processes that we uh, do right now. So the bulk of the, uh, that takes up the 703, 750 for the um, technology. In the uh, curriculum area, the, uh, the money really comes under two main categories. The first is with um, textbooks, equipment, and software subscriptions that are part of our uh, core instructional programs. Um, just as some context each year, the curricular coordinators, uh, they work on a five-year cycle for our budget for their respective departments um, and include review and renewal of those things as part of their five-year plan. Um, I then work with them and look at the whole budget and um, balance out expenses and prioritize purchases um, each year as we, as we work on this budget. Um, so the cuts made here to the curricular budget delay and extend the curricular review and renewal cycle, um, both with textbooks, equipment, and software subscriptions. It causes us to have to use um, resources beyond their intended lifespan and potentially pay for additional years of online access to some resources that our um, online subscription expires. Um, as some examples, um, the, uh, one of the areas where we're delaying is the consistent implementation of instruments used for our elementary music program. Uh, we do not yet have all 10 elementary schools with the same core instruments that are used as part of instruction, so that will be delayed. Uh, we are uh, delaying the implementation of a science kit um, in first grade, which um, has a copyright of 2002, and um, by delaying that, um, we're not able to move it uh, from currently where that um, information or that content is presented in grade three 
to grade one where it aligns to the standards. Um, the second impact uh, within this, these funds that you see here is on the, um, the funds which support ongoing professional learning for staff. These opportunities related to our strategic plan and district areas of equity and STEAM, as well as work to support teachers refining best practices within their curricular areas through attending both external workshops as well as bringing outside consultants in to work with teachers. So we are um, in many cases eliminating some of those um, different opportunities which will uh, delay some of the learning and, and impact some of the work that we have been doing to date in district around some of our uh, more um, major issues um, related to aspects within our strategic plan. And that's the uh, curriculum uh, reductions. In the area of special services, we have um, eliminated some software that we had planned to add to our program for supplemental instruction. In uh, psychological services, we have cut, uh, we're delaying the purchase of test kits um, and some uh, decrease the amount we had for private evaluations. And we also typically have one or two psychology interns and we will not be uh, utilizing interns next year. In all of my, the programs, uh, the Sloan Achieve programs and all the areas of nursing, psychology, counseling, um, I, I made uh, small cuts, under, usually under $5,000 or so in all of their supplies, books, other fees and services, but they added up to $90,000 once you look at it in all the different areas and in all the different programs. Uh, we, I made a reduction in our um, homebound instruction. We had been piloting, just started piloting before the closure using um, Canvas as, that's already in place to provide some of that instruction. So uh, we'll just have to speed up that pilot work and, and try to implement that sooner to save some costs there. And then lastly, the largest area was um, in legal costs uh, costs associated with settlement agreements, comp compensatory education, and then separate from that in terms of uh, for tuitions that we pay to for educational services for students who are placed outside of Council Rock by juvenile justice system, uh, children and youth, mental health, whatever it might be. Um, those are areas that I, I don't know what they are, so I have to, you know, make an estimate based on trends. Um, I, it, I, instead of going with where I thought they would go based on past several years. I just took us back to the baseline of where we were last year and hopefully we can stay within that line. If not, we will then, in, you know, sometime next year have to make some transfers in areas uh, related to the classrooms, but I wanted to start there first. The business department budget really represents the remainder of anything else that can't be uh, included in, in another department's budget. And so it's sort of a, a miscellaneous uh, group of reductions. Uh, the, the first reduction proposed is to eliminate the 5% fee paid to the county for the collection of delinquent real estate taxes. Uh, we would need to do that through contracting with a third party collector, which would require some, uh, some footwork on, on our part to ensure the cooperation of the existing collector, the, the Bucks County Tax Claim Bureau. That's estimated at about $120,000 of that, uh, that total. Uh, the next largest uh, reduction is an assumed flat increase to our insurance policy renewals, which we will bring forward to you in June. So the pressure is on our broker to try to secure uh, at least a flat renewal uh, from, our, uh, from our providers, and they are doing that through marketing efforts. Um, but we do also have the ability to change deductibles and coverage limits to reduce premium levels if we don't achieve that, that flat renewal. Uh, obviously doing so uh, puts the district at additional risk in the event of a, of a loss in, in the upcoming year. Um, this, the next item is a reduction in other tax collection fees, particularly for earned income taxes and transfer taxes. So you can see on, on this side of the budget, we've got significant reductions in both of those line items. Um, those do have a fee associated with the collection of those. And we, uh, so obviously the reduction in, in the expenses is a result of collecting less revenue, but, the, but collecting less revenue is, uh, is a more significant impact. Um, so that's a, 
that's a, ultimately a, a, a loss for us. And then lastly, uh, there's another about $56,000 of what I'll call miscellaneous reductions, uh, including in supply line items in, in my department, uh, professional development in, in my department. Um, but we are also anticipating savings associated with the copier RFP that I mentioned uh, a, a few moments ago in, in the earlier part of the presentation. Uh, so that's what uh, that's what's comprising that uh, $292,000 for the business department reductions. Okay, in um, regarding building allocations, we're looking at a 13% reduction across schools. Um, this reduction would have an impact directly on classrooms uh, by way of typical classroom supplies, replacing major pieces of equipment um, for the school and foregoing the purchase of, of instructional devices. So essentially that $247,000 represents a 13% uh, reduction per, in the per pupil allocation. In the K-12, um, Bill, do you want me to go on or are you gonna take transportation? I'll go ahead, finish uh, K-12 ed and then I'll move to transportation. Um, K-12 education, that also includes the ISDS department, the information system decision support department. And we will be uh, recommending that we postpone the onboarding of a, uh, an online registration system. That's uh, about $28,000 and we will continue with our paper and pencil model that we, we do now. Um, 16,000 of that dollars, it was our intent to pay for every student in 11th grade to take the PSAT. PSAT uh, test leads to determining national merit scholars and um, scholarships. And we desire to have all of our students participate in that um, because right now it's a uh, pay as you go and families pay for that. Um, and then the other allocation, the other uh, reductions recommended um, would include support hours for hardware, um, hardware contracts as it relates to Time Clock Plus and the reduction of um, tablets for the use of our time clock, time clock plus system. All right, thanks, Andy. Uh, transportation, this is a straightforward reduction. Uh, we are proposing to, to only be able to replace one student van. Uh, so in the event that, that more than one van breaks down, we will be uh, at a disadvantage and our fleet will uh, continue to age. It's very similar to the reductions that uh, Mr. Taylor made in uh, in the grounds department. So that's uh, that reduction represents, uh, instead of the planned replacement of two vans, just uh, replacement of one van. Okay. The reduction under the Human Resources Office represents the removal of funding for the selection and implementation of new software for benefits administration. Our current HRAS system is extremely limited and we have no ability to transmit data to our six different carriers. So what that does is it creates a redundancy of effort on the part of the benefits specialist who has to enter every change outside of open enrollment and every new enrollment into six different distinct portals. So the exploration and selection of software that would allow us to transmit that data would greatly increase our efficiency, our accuracy. It would also enhance our ability to provide um, additional self-service capabilities for our employees. And it would also allow us to, with more ease and accuracy, convey information to the payroll department for payroll deductions with benefits. Benefits is such a huge part of our budget. So the administration of benefits with you know, greater efficiency and ease is um, something that we really did want to pursue through some new software, but this cut would represent us not doing that at this time. For community relations, uh, the budget there is relatively small compared to the other budgets. Um, the bulk of the, of the money there goes towards our website hosting cost and our communication platform, but we were able to give back um, $5,000 most of which is attributed to monies that were 
set aside for um, some additional supplies relative to video projects, lavalier mics, tripods, things of that nature, um, tabletop microphones, handheld microphones, just to support video um, projects. And then the larger amount was um, monies that um, I earmarked for graphic design work, um, work that would kind of improve branding and marketing, um, you know, uh, cleaning up some mascots and, and just brightening up some things that we have that are comparison pieces with the website. All right, so thank you. Uh, thank you to my colleagues for taking that load off me and I'll apologize that I tried to get you off the hook by speeding ahead, but I was unsuccessful. I got caught. So Dr. Frazier, I don't know if you'd like to uh, put a bow on, uh, on that part of the discussion before we open it up to any, uh, any comments uh, from, or questions from the board members. Yeah, I think so. Thanks, Mr. Stone. So, you know, going, going through these reductions and, and looking at the impacts of these reductions, you just got a quick synopsis uh, of that. Uh, some of them directly impact students and student learning. Some of them are more systems based, but not unimportant. Um, the fact that it is 2020 and we still have a paper based registration system uh, probably isn't the way things should be. I would say the same for the human resources software from a benefits standpoint that we're dealing with. So. Um, Please, I don't want anyone listening to um, walk away with the impression that any of these reductions were easy. Um, but yet we recognize the situation that we're in. As Mr. Block has said earlier, we got this big blue uh, statement with a rather sizable dollar figure there. That, that number that we're looking at there, that $5.98 million deficit um, includes includes all of these reductions, this 3.26 million in reductions. And remember that it also assumes a full 3.1% uh, tax increase. So we still have a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, we will do that work. We will um, obviously any additional reductions that we consider or um, or might possibly recommend are going to be even more impactful in a negative way than what we have here on this list. So I think this this number, this 5.9, almost $6 million deficit number, coupled with what you just heard, uh, reductions uh, of over $3 million to get down to that number, um, show you just how much pain there will be in getting this number down even further. Um, and to the question, uh, Andy, that you threw out earlier, what's the, what's the FTE equivalency? Um, when you're talking about 60 or 65 teachers, you're not talking about um, cutting just a program. You're talking about multiple programs. And that is a situation that we don't want to find ourselves in for this upcoming school year or the year after or the year after. So there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, we need to do this work together. Um, everyone needs to be part of the solution. And I'm confident that that'll be the case. Uh, but without a doubt, we got a lot of work. And we'll be looking uh, to update the board and the community again on May 21st. And then again, at the joint committee meeting the first week of June, and uh, all leading up to board approval at the June board meeting on uh, on June 18th. Thanks, Bill. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Bilek, would you like to facilitate any questions before we move on to the uh, long-term plan? Uh, sure. Does anyone have any uh, questions at this point? Uh, Mr. Black? Thank you, Mr. Bilek. Um, first, let me say uh, great detailed presentation. Uh, you continue to um, uh, bring bring together all the information in an, in an easy to understand way. It's not the, the message that any of us want to hear, obviously. Um, you know, but but I'm proud of the way that uh, that we've managed our finances, and we're looking at it from a long term perspective. I just got a text from a member of the public uh, who's looking at that big number, and they said, "Could you imagine?" what type of situation you'd be in if you hadn't done the work that you've been doing over time. Um, this, this board, prior boards, this administration, prior administrations um, have faced challenges um, and, and, and found efficiencies uh, without putting the burden completely on the, on the taxpayer. Um, if you look at what PISERS alone has done and what the, the um, uh, capital needs of our buildings have done to our ability to invest in the classroom, 
uh, it's, 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 I've been proud to be able to start to have done that over the last several years. So um, let me just tip my hat to the team that's got us to here where we're in a really tough spot, but it, you know, really, it could have been a lot worse if we didn't have a really sound financial footing of the district and a really great approach to, uh, to how we did things. So um, thank you for, uh, for that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Black. Uh, Dr. Thower, you have a question? Yeah, I, more comment than a question to Mr. Stone. Um, these cuts, while well, in in the order or of the order, fifteen percent are are basically three hundred to nine hundred uh, block cuts, which are honestly a tiny part of our overall budget. I don't think there's much more blood in that stone. Um, what are we gonna? Uh, you know, I hear numbers of sixty and stuff, but I don't see details. So. Um, when this comes back the next time, my request is I, I, I need just I mean there's I know you're still working on it and I don't want to detract from that, but there's still six million dollars here um, that we have to, to patch over somewhere. And if I'm remembering right, the 300 to 900 part of our 248 million dollar budget is what about 30 million total? So uh, a little higher than that, about 58, 59 million. Eight million. Okay. Um, one fifth of the overall budget work. Right. So, right. Um, I, I just, th there's not much more you can do here, it, it, is I guess where I'm going before you start, you know, closing things. And I'll end with um, that's that 20% reduction in technology means no Chromebooks for kids, no one to one, no two to one. We're, 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 we're kind of in trouble there when it comes to technology as well. Okay, that, thank you, Dr. Thorne. Anyone else uh, on this section? Um, you know, I'll just say uh, very much what Andy and Mike just said. Over the years, we've worked uh, as a board and as an, with the administration to really cut um, almost all the fat, really all the fat out of this budget. So there isn't, this is a lot of great work and I know that we're to the bone already. Um, and I think Mike's, right that it really and I think it falls on the probably the entire cabinet to come back and say programmatically what are we looking at cutting more if we're stuck at this 5.9 million dollars and that's assuming a 4.1 or a 4.9 million dollar tax increase if we're talking about 2.6 or 3.1 percent right and we still don't know if we're there yet right because we still haven't voted for that um, so I guess that would be a terrible discussion to have about what kind of programs we're looking to, to cut, but I think it is going to be important to have. Uh, that's all I have. Oh, Ed, you have a question? Yeah, it's actually a question and a, and a comment. I, I appreciate the work as, as everybody else has said. Uh, two points of questions that I do have. Uh, Christine Taylor and, and Andy Sanko, um, that they're cutting out software that actually could make our life easier. Um, to me, I, I think that should be relooked at and, and see how we can not remove that from this reduction and find something else uh, equivalent that, that makes a little bit more sense. Um, if we can get the software to do the work for us, why would we consider that? Uh, the second point of interest, a question, and this could go across everyone's uh, bow, is any of these cuts, will they affect continued distance learning? In, in areas that if we if we aren't putting these kids back in the schools till next year, are any of these cuts going to affect the efficiency of what we're seeing today? Um, and or, you know, or, or is is that something that was considered when we when we put this table together? So I think I'll um, I'll leave that question to either Matt and or uh, Sue Elliott for for some clarification. I mean, I think that. In general, yes, distance learning is is becoming more of a possibility as we think about next year. So, um, but I, I don't want to speak to, um, you know, specifically how it could impact the the potential. Um, do do you either of you have anything that you would want to add to that? I'll jump in with the, about the technology. I'm sorry, Dr. Elliott. That's okay. Go ahead, Mr. Fredrickson. Um, so, from a distance learning standpoint. What impacts the, our ability to do that is the availability of the technology for the students and for the teachers. Um, 
what we're removing from the budget doesn't allow us to refresh some of that equipment or replace some of that equipment, as well as some of the infrastructure equipment. Um, it's not something that I would choose to do willingly, but it's something that we need to do to survive. So what's gonna happen is, is as we continue, and we do this every week, we were replacing Chromebooks, we're still issuing Chromebooks to families that need them. Um, we're gonna get to a point where there's nothing in the well, the well's dry, because there's no money there to replace the equipment or to fix the equipment that's broken. And that's the danger. Um, and I think Dr. Thorat said it very well uh, earlier is, you know, you're getting to a point where there's just this small piece of budget to take from. So when Bill came to us and said, look, what can you cut? Of course, we all said nothing. And he said, okay, let me put it to you a different way. You're going to cut this amount. So that's what we had to do because that's what we have to do. That's the position we're in. Um, I don't think it's anything we want to do. But from a distance learning standpoint, even though a lot of the platforms are in the cloud, the Google, the Canvas, and we're taking advantage of those technologies, uh, it's the technology that's getting us there. It's the shared file and resources that the district use that are stored on the servers at the data center. So I think we'll be okay, but I can't guarantee it. Yeah, and just to, just to piggyback on that real fast, I think um, I, I, I certainly agree with Mr. Fredrickson's assessment there. I, I don't think the concern so much is for the upcoming school year. We'll, we'll still have the two to one ratio um, just because of the age of our current Chromebooks. What, what we're doing here effectively is kick it, uh, kicking the can down the road. Mm -hmm. And so sooner or later that comes back to bite you. So we, um, we, we, we have a, a replacement cycle that Mr. Fredrickson and I have been working on, continue to work on. And obviously this, this puts a significant uh, dent into that plan. So um, it, this is a move that we can make for one year. It's not easy to make. We're certainly not upgrading or improving anything, but I think that uh, we will be able to get by next year. Uh, beyond that, it becomes uh, even, even more problematic, I think. Yeah, and I, th and I think it's fair. We, we are all in the same boat here. We're looking at a two-year, three-year down the road, as we're going to see on the next slide. Um, if this has to be replicated for another year or two, and, and to Dr. Thorwood's point, point, you know, where are we going to be? Um, I'm not looking for an answer. I'm just throwing it out there. So from a curricular standpoint, uh, when we engaged in this work to find reductions, we really looked at it through the lens of the possibility that we are going to be uh, potentially doing some distance learning at some point in time next year and really work to maintain as many of our digital resources as possible. Uh, we did make some reductions in some of those. For example, uh, one of our uh, history subscriptions that we were renewing, we, um, and it wasn't a new, uh, a new resource, it was just a renewal of a current resource. Uh, we uh, had a quote for a six year subscription for that but have um, been able to work with the company to get a three-year subscription. So we've reduced that cost, but um, again, it, it's allowing us to maintain that resource for teachers to use, uh, but is you know a little bit of a savings there. But for the most part, uh, the curricular cuts that we made, we really tried to avoid any, um, digital resource that would have implications for potential distance learning um, in the coming years. Thank you both for that, I appreciate it. Sorry. Ed, do you, do you have another question? No, I'm good, Mark, thank you. Um, let me ask if I could, uh, Dr. Elliott, do you, do you see any potential efficiencies coming out of this that, that maybe would, um, would grow in the future from distance learning? And what I mean by that is I'm certain that there's children out there that are maybe excelling um, and doing a little bit better working from home than they were in the classroom. So have you done any work to identify what that's looking at? And, you know, not to... Um, Put a wrench in things or excite people but um is it can a can a teacher oversee a class of um greater than 30 if they're all remote um and is that maybe something in the future that 
Council Rock can, can use to um, hedge some of these risks that we have around our financials. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Uh, I think it does, and I'll, I'll attempt to answer it. And if I haven't quite answered all your questions, Mark, please let me know um, if there's something else that I'm not quite getting to. So from I'll start backwards from the lens of your question about, uh, in essence, more students to a teacher ratio, or in essence, a larger class size in a distance learning setting. Uh, that would uh, be more difficult, actually, because when you're um, teaching through distance learning, the planning and uh, the ability to respond to students takes much more time uh, than it does in a face-to-face -face setting. So adding more students to the classroom for a teacher would actually make it a bit more difficult for a teacher to navigate and manage. Um, when it comes to the use of our resources and students as learners, I don't think that it's fair to make a judgment on the success of distance learning in the context of the situation that we've been put in. Um, if we truly were looking at distance learning as a, a methodology or that we wanted to use, it would require us to do much more planning, curriculum development, and work um, before we even got to a distance learning setting to make sure it was successful. and the speed at which we needed to shift from brick and mortar to distance learning uh, for our students. And our, our planning team and our teachers have done an incredible job, but um, I wouldn't wanna compare what we're doing now to uh, get any sense of whether or not this, this mode has been truly successful for our students because our students also are dealing with in their homes, unprecedented circumstances where I would uh, suggest that even what they're dealing with in their homes isn't what would be typical of a student who would be in a distance learning environment by choice as well. Sure. Did that answer your questions? Absolutely, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Dr. Thorwart. I just wanna piggyback off that, Mark. Um, I, I think what Dr. Elliott said, and, and she can correct me if I'm wrong, is based on our circumstances, we were very successful with distance learning now, um, but we'd hardly equate that to normal learning if we were gonna start practicing it in normal times. So I don't, I, I, I think, and I agree with Dr. Elliott that uh, our teachers have done an incredible job and, and they've taken basically a, a terrible situation and done what they could, but, moving forward, this is not how they want to work, nor is it how we want to deliver education in mass to these kids. I don't, I don't think it's right. And I've got two sitting in the house now trying to do it. So I, I can tell you it, 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 it's, it's great what's been done, but it's not great from a, an education standpoint. And Dr. Elliott, correct me if I'm wrong. I would agree with everything that you're saying, Dr. Thorwart. Thank you. Uh, and, and and I don't want to get into a debate here. And I I, I understand what, what Dr. Elliott said, Mike. Um, the uh, you know sometimes there are positive things that arise out of terrible situations. So if there was a small group of students that would benefit greatly from a distance learning situation, and now we already have it up and running, and we can uh, you know the byproduct of that is we have a better education situation for some small subset of kids, or maybe even a, a a larger subset, I don't know, and and it um, could save money, that would be a good thing. It sounds like the saving money part of it isn't there either. So it's fine. It's, it's a good answer. Thank you. Well, and I will say, Mr. Bialik, if you talk about something good that has come out of this unprecedented um, circumstance, I can share that by and large, um, overwhelmingly consistent feedback I have gotten from from curriculum coordinators, from teachers, uh, from administrators, is that the um, collaborative work that our teachers are doing as a result of this situation has increased immensely. And when it comes to the work that we've been doing around PLCs and understanding how to work collaboratively and, and really think and plan together, this uh, opportunity, if you want to call it an opportunity, has really 
um, helped many of our teachers to uh, really value their colleagues more than ever. And um, they are collaborating on a regular basis. In many cases, I've heard that some of them are collaborating daily with their colleagues to help, help each other through this and support in planning and, and working with um, how to make the best of this learning situation for our students. So there definitely is a bit of a silver lining that we can take out of this, although not a cost savings. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, a lot of teachers are not only taking care of their students, but they're taking care of their own kids as their home. So it's very difficult. All right. Sorry to draw out that discussion, Matt, uh, or uh, Bill, do you want to move forward? Yes, thank you, Mr. Byler. So, um, the, we're we're on the last two official steps of our of our budget timeline, but there is obviously a significant amount of work that has to happen between now and, and June 18th. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't publicly thank the Financial Advisory Committee uh, for their efforts to uh, refocus their work on very short notice. Um, their, if, if the board will recall, their plan was initially to um, just simply observe the budget process and make make recommendations about um, how things are how things are working. But um, at their own um, at their own decision, they they dove right in and started analyzing data for us and have already provided me with a preliminary report of uh, recommendations that that will will review internally and determine whether they can uh, be any items that we that we'll be able to implement um, to help with that remaining six million dollars um, moving forward okay so we're now going to transition into the synopsis financial planning module which if you recall is web-based so you just have to bear with me for a moment while i switch the screen over uh, to uh, show you that tool and uh, interact with it Forgive me, I do need to log back in because I timed out. Just one more second. Okay, Matt, I presume you have me back, correct? Yes, sir. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, all right. So uh, we, what we're going to do is we're, we're going to walk through the, the financial planning model, and it's going to look pretty similar to, to what you've seen uh, when, we, when we looked at this in, in November. So we're going to start by reorienting to where we were in November, pre-COVID-19, and some of the assumptions and results that we were, we were working with. So you can see, uh, if, I'm, if you see my pointer here, um, we were looking at in what I'll, co I'll consider a normal budgeting environment. We were looking at budget deficits annually growing from about $4 million up to about $10 million over the next five years. So this, this column here is, is the current year budget that we're in now. This would be the budget that the pro proposed final budget that was just approved um, and uh, so on and so forth. So you can see, obviously, with deficits of that magnitude, we quickly deplete our fund balance and end up in a position that we uh, do not want to be in. Um, this also assumed tax increases in the low two percents every year, and again, that was based on sort of an average of the of the Act One index over time. So you you may recall this this graphic here showing our projected revenues and expenditures, the red line here being the expenses and the blue line being uh, the revenues. And you're seeing that consistent gap between the red and the blue and it, and it grows ever, ever so slightly um, each year. So in, in this model, we were seeing projections of about 2% revenue growth. And a lot of that was driven by the, the real estate tax increase. Uh, but expenditures, prim again, primarily due to mandated expenses, uh, retirement expenses in particular, growing at about two and a quarter to two and three quarters percent every year, and that and that gap growing out over time. So this is a this is an ugly one, but what it's what it is showing is a side by side of some major major assumptions that have now changed as a result of the the pandemic, and these are. 
these particular um, uh, assumptions are not ones that we're going to see an immediate impact on. We, we talked at length about earned income tax. There's a meet, an immediate impact as a result of uh, the, the pandemic on earned income taxes. But if you recall, we talked about uh, at, the, at the last meeting that in, in particular, the Act 1 index is a lagging indicator of a recession. So in our original, uh, in our original plan back in November, you see that uh, obviously, I've put in what we've proposed in, in the what's in the proposed final budget, the 3.1%, but you see 2.2% tax increases for the remainder of that baseline plan. And you also see assessed value growth at about 2.2%, which is consistent with our historical trend. Now, if you move over into the purple table to the right here, you're seeing again that 3.1% just to keep the, the, the next year consistent. But you see an Act 1 index that's lower than what's assumed in the baseline. And that Act 1 index is based on the lowest number, uh, the uh, lowest average that it had been in the years uh, subsequent to the Great Recession of 08 09. Uh, the Act 1 index was in the 1.4, 1.7% 1 range. Uh, so when you plug that in, it will have an impact. And I've also factored in a decrease in the assessed value for a couple of years of this plan because. In typical economic recession environments, there is generally a reduction in assessed value as a result of assessment appeals. Moving down to the PEASERS contribution rate, this one is fairly straightforward. This just shows an increased PEASERS rate of about 1% per year. Uh, so instead of a 34.95% in 2022, it assumes a 35.95%. And that's a result of market performance. So as the stock market goes, so goes the contribution rate to the PEASER system. And PEASERS assumes a 7.5% rate of return on its investments in order to uh, quote unquote guarantee the, the rates it's projected. Um, but at, in, a, in, a, in the stock market that we've seen, uh, we may possibly see uh, increases to that rate, which will obviously drive up expenses. And then also we are assuming uh, normal attrition in the uh, em employee cost group. So it's a little tricky to, to follow the, the logic here, but what you're seeing is you're, you're seeing folks moving into and out of the top salary on our, uh, on our schedule. So there's a net impact of, uh, for this CREA of folks moving out of the average salary into the top salary and then new hires replacing folks that retire. So we've got the 30 retirements here uh, and then assuming 20 in the in the out years. So those are the uh, those are the assumptions that we're that we're updating in, in the next uh, in the next model. So you can also see I won't I won't spend a lot of time going through each and every one of these uh, growth rates here, but you, you what you see is a little bit of little bit of goofiness. Um, you see some fairly large increases in some of these accounts. And the reason for those large increases is to simply get us back up to a baseline. So in the projection model, it's taking what we are planning to spend in the current year and applying those rates to future years. But as you just saw, we have seven and a half million dollars of estimated savings in the current year, whereas we are likely going to come back at some point to a full um, in, to, a, to a normal expenditure model where we would see substitute costs similar to what we typically spend and transportation costs running at, at 100%. So we have to adjust those numbers in the first year to get back on track. Similarly, we made some of those reductions with, with transportation. You see that 33% decrease in the first year. That's to show that impact of not paying for transportation costs this year earned income tax, I've tried to estimate the, the impact of, you see a plus 6%. That's trying to show the impact of that deferred revenue being pushed from this fiscal year into the next fiscal year. So moving over into this chart here, what you're seeing is some of the, the, the different assumptions and now the, the new reality of COVID-19 and how it's gonna impact our finances. So recall that you were seeing uh, negative $4 million growing to about $10 million. But you see um, the operating surplus right there that I'm circling for, for this current year. So we've trued it up to where I think we're going to finish. And then you see the deficits moving into the next year. Again, it's, this is not a precise budget 
uh, tool. This is this is an, an estimation, and it it tells a story rather than than a precise um, a precise number. So you see that 5.7. That's pretty close to our 5.9 that that we just that we just talked about, and you see how quickly those numbers increase instead of seeing four, four, five, six, nine. You see six, ten, thirteen. 16 and 19 and how quickly our, our fund balance uh, is is depleted in in that situation so we're essentially resetting our our expectations utilizing those assumptions we talked about a lower act one index higher peasers rate and these growth rate assumptions that you see over here on the right and obviously this is something that i can update at any point uh, to review this so what i'll do is i'll i'll, I'll show you as i change each of these assumptions you're going to see the those changes reflected on these two lines here so this is the same chart that you saw on the prior slide assumes our baseline expectations so as i change each of the each of the assumptions here we move to a break even model We change the property taxes to a lower act one index pay particular attention in this scenario to the blue line and see how it drops away from the red line and then the employer contribution rate we choose higher peasers rate and it just sort of reset the axis here but you again see we started a baseline of 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 uh equal revenue and expenses but this gap grows significantly when compared to to what we were looking at in the in the previous example So Bill, can we pause there just for a second? Because I know I have a question. Does anyone else have a question about that terrible news that we just saw? Well, it was well presented, Bill, but- um, <laughs> well, Thank uh, you for that, at least. <laughs> uh, and I haven't had, this is the first I've seen this projection. Uh, I don't know, Kristen, if you had a chance to sit with Bill today, but um, tell, me, tell me what this means, the expected, um, because I'm reading that as, um, a normal budget, but I think I'm misreading that. Yeah, I think that maybe is a uh, perhaps could be um, uh, could have been better defined. The the expected is now um, what we are what what I am expecting to happen in a COVID nineteen okay. um, financial world. So when that the expected growth rates reflect these these rates in this table here, so showing us kind of coming back to normal on on our expenses to estimate a full year, but then showing some declines in potential state state subsidy. Earned income tax was estimated at, uh, I think about 2% in the baseline. So you're seeing some, some decreases in those revenue accounts primarily to get us to this, uh, this particular um, graphic. What is pessimistic uh, drop down to? What's the range? Uh, I am gonna get to that. You are, okay. Yes, I am. Yep. Anyone else? Uh, Mike, uh, Dr. Thorwood has a question. Yeah, I, I just want to confirm, I struggle a little bit with these graphs, as you know, Bill, which is a, what you're saying here is your projection out to 2025 is we're spending more than we're, we're uh, generating in revenue every year. Yes, well said. Um, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll comment it from a household budget. You can't do that. So, um, not, not for any sustainable period of time. So um, now I'm interested in what uh, Mark, Mark just asked for in terms of a pessimistic budget, if this is expected. Right, so I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't go through the, this, this, there's a full scenario built out with, with pessimistic assumptions and I didn't put a slide together to, to show that, but it, I can very quickly flip to what a pessimistic um, model would look like here. And what you, oh, that was an interesting, interesting move that it did there. Um, so because I only made the, it's, it's now, it's looking to this table, it, it's not looking to this table anymore. So I didn't true up these, these figures in the first column. So, but what you can see is, is still this, instead of, you know, this is now a, that's what, $15 million. Yeah, so it's, you know, you're seeing a, a fairly similar, fairly similar impact and I can 
update that and send a snip to the board so that they can see what that what that okay. actually looks Thank like. You. So, Bill, I like the line graph, but does it does it follow the uh, does it follow the table above, or does the table above follow the line graph? So, can we see the this, yeah? So this table right. here, this purple oh, table, table right. yeah, is the is the growth rates here. Mm -hmm. So there's a there's a red table that I could put up here that shows the pessimistic growth rates. But again, I would need to it would it wouldn't take me too long. I just didn't do it for this evening um, to true up these these numbers so that they match. Um, and we have this, the same starting point um, and just make sure that the, the pessimistic scenario really reflects uh, the, new, the, the new reality of pessimism. Yeah, I understand that. It, my question is, so the table on the right, if you go up to the top, it, mm -hmm. it says um, the projection results. When you, when you move the, um, the expected and uh, pessimistic that changed your line graph, but does it also change this table or are there separate controls completely separate there? I see. Okay. It does. It change it. Yeah, it changes. I have to control them in, in different places, Individual. but they're the same, the same base assumptions. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, uh, Joe Hidalgo has a question. Um, could you go back to the, hi Bill, can you go back to the, uh, the chart where it was showing like 15 million, $18 million deficit in 2025, and we have a fund balance of negative $22 million. How realistic is that? Well, all if all the assumptions come true exactly as uh, as predicted, which is unlikely, but um, I think reasonable that the assumptions are reasonable based on what I know today. Um, and you know, certainly we would intervene before uh, before that happens. So it just I think what this is showing you is that we wouldn't have a starting budget deficit in each of these years of $9.6 million in, as we look ahead to next year, we would have a starting deficit of $13 million two years from now and so on. So, you know, obviously uh, um, we would, we are not allowed to pass a budget that is uh, in the, in the negative. Um, so we would, you know, it would be, uh, we would have to, we have to intervene. We, we, we have okay. no choice. Can you just show me of the best case scenario? You can click on those dots real quick, a better scenario. I, I, uh, I confess that I didn't look much at optimism. Uh, okay, and that's fine. I haven't been very optimistic in the last few, uh, in the last few weeks, um, but I can, a year. I can turn, <laughs> I can turn it on and yeah, so I'm be, I was very optimistic. This shows um, some significant, some significant growth and some significant savings, which um, again, because we didn't, um, because I didn't update the growth rates on the expected, it's not giving us the, the proper, it's not giving us the proper data because it's basing off of minus 7 million of expenditures in, in, the, in the base year. That is just not reasonable. Well, thanks. I, I, I love that software. I think it's, it was a good thing we got that. Been very helpful indeed. Appreciate it. Sure. That's it. Okay, we can move on. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. And so this this last slide uh, does kind of piggyback off of the uh, of, of the one that we uh, just previously saw. It again shows that same table here with those assumptions. But this this report over here is just a, a differential of what the what is in the new uh, the new expectation versus the baseline? So anything in red is bad. So you're seeing declines in local revenues. You're just you're seeing these are increases in expenditures year over year, and again that that fund balance and deficit growing uh, year over year. But I think what is probably most helpful are these two uh, these two tables here. Um, so what you are what you're seeing here is the projected revenues versus expenditures. So that, that blue and red line, um, the baseline numbers are the dashed lines that you're seeing. And then the solid lines are the new projection. So you're, you're seeing that we had a fairly consistent gap that grew a little bit in the out years, whereas we have that in, on, the, on the dashed lines, but on the, on the solid lines, you've got a much more pronounced gap, that revenue line really lags, lags beneath um, what we had originally projected in the baseline. 
And then on this table to the right here, um, you can see the green line is our, is our um, ending fund balance. And so right here is zero. So you see in three years, we would dip below zero, which is similar to the baseline, but then you can see just how dramatic it, it drops from, from that dash baseline. The orange line is the, is the, I would call it the starting budget deficit. Um, so again, in the 13, 15 and $20 million ranges in the, in the three out years. So I'm gonna uh, quick walk back to the last slide and actually I think I can do it from here. I'm gonna show you the impact of, of no tax increase. Um, and I'm gonna show that to you in two ways. I'm gonna show you that in, in next year's budget and I'm gonna show you that in, uh, in all the budgets, which is in, uh, in our scenario here. So I'm gonna turn on that, make sure that's on, okay. So I'm gonna flip this to the pessimistic scenario and you're gonna to wanna to watch the blue line. So that's no tax increase in this year. So that dropped that line. And then you also noticed, I'll, I'll flip it back quickly. So you, what, what I wanna point out is not just the drop in the first year, but then how it continues to keep that blue line lower. So I'll show it one more time. So you never quite catch up to where you could be if you implement that no tax increase. So let me show you just the, again, to exaggerate, to make the point, I suppose you could say, I will turn on no tax increase. And it's a similar graph, but the, the differences are, are, are more pronounced here in this pessimistic uh, scenario. Bill, is yeah. my own. Yeah. Is, is there a way to do a side-by-side -side table? Um, I love the line charts, but I really like those uh, number tables of, uh, uh, in the, you know, in the top. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a way to have, since you got the two tables there, a no tax increase and a full tax increase side-by-side -side so we can see that? And I'm not asking for it today, but maybe something you can send up to the board. I can do that for sure. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. All right, so I'm gonna just put this back on the, oops, pardon me, the expected scenario here. And just, um, there's there's two things to, to point out here as far as the model. Uh, you know, this is based on what we know today. And frankly, it's not very much um, as far as what this impact is gonna be. So this is, a, this is a model that fortunately can be easily updated, but that right now is based on a lot of uncertainty. Um, the other thing that's that's important to note, the last time we went through this exercise in um, it's January or February, I believe, we, we spent a lot of time talking about how to layer in funding for our, our projects, um, major tech upgrades, uh, devices, smart boards, et cetera, and then also our summer projects. That's not factored in into these analyses yet. So, I mean, I can, I can quickly turn on those, uh, those scenarios. Um, oh, man, I don't have that. Uh, I can show you three turning Please, on. I don't want any more bad news. I, I, <laughs> so it's just going to show. Bill, even if you just applied summer projects, that's basic maintenance. Can you put that in there? That's what I just, that's okay. what I just turned on. And again, it probably would be more helpful to see the side by side table because again, these, these line graphs all look the same. Um, but I think what you're, Here's what you'll see here. Capital outflows three million dollars. So contributing into that growing, growing deficit there. So we we have we, you know we have to we have to develop a plan for for funding the um, not just summer maintenance projects but also um, educational initiatives that we have on the horizon. Rock block in particular, potentially school start times, uh, technology upgrades. Um, there are there are a lot of things that that are going to need to be addressed, and and we'll have the ability to use this tool to do it. But the the numbers are a bit sobering as we as we try to uh, come to that decision. Okay, I, I believe that's enough uh, doom and gloom from me, but I'll be happy to answer any questions. All right. If I, if I just make a comment, so there's 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 still ten folks sticking with us. 
which are great. I'll say the same thing I did earlier. Uh, one of them raised their hand, uh, unfortunately, based on um, inappropriate conduct in the uh, the chat box. We we we've had to uh, change our meeting. So um, looks like uh, Ms. Primo, if you do have a question you'd like to ask, you can uh, you can send uh, an email to uh, to, to Mr. Uh, Mr. Stone, and uh, I'm sure he'll be happy to get back to you. Unfortunately, we can't take it tonight. Uh, sorry, I'm not muted. Okay, any questions from the board? Joe, do you have a question? Is your hand still up from last time? Joe Hidalgo? Can anyone hear me? Yeah, we hear you, Joe says no. He's on mute, but he's saying no. Oh, okay, thank you. All right. Um, Bill, that's an excellent presentation. It's terrible. Again, it's terrible, but well done. Um, you know, I just don't know what to say. I'll say to my fellow board members, I had a discussion with um, our past colleague and now our state representative, Wendy Thomas, and uh, we had a discussion about the legislation that was proposed to uh, eliminate or take away our ability to increase taxes this year. And I know that we were all, we were all against that. One of the things I talked to Wendy about, and I'll share with you is if a school district, if we could, if, if we could um, have some legislation and maybe amend that legislation, which she was interested in, if a school district did pass a zero tax increase in, for, for an example, a, um, two, or a 2021 20, school year budget, that uh, they would have the ability to have relief from the Act One index for a period of years after that, so that you don't have that compounding effect. So if you think that may be a good idea, I'd reach out to Wendy. Uh, you might wanna um, coordinate with the IU. I don't know uh, if it's something that, that could uh, uh, gain some steam in Harrisburg, but she seemed to think that she could go to the writer of the original bill and sign on to that bill if it was, if it was adjusted to be something like that where it still gave us flexibility, but just a thought, because it is, it's is—it's a difficult situation to say, let's tax our neighbors right now, um, but we do have to look at the long-term effect of that. And it's, uh, it's, you know, it's the compounding effect of that elimination of that tax, uh, that, that tax increase is not lost on me for sure. Uh, Mr. Solomon, you have a question? Yeah, and I guess it can go to either Bill or Dr. Frazier. You know, there was an article in yesterday's Bucks County Courier Times about Ben Salem's situation. What what have you heard and during your conversations with your counterparts? Uh, obviously, we're we're all going towards the same level of of bad news. It depends on where you are, I assume. What are some of the things that are we are we seeing some consistencies in thought processes, or or is there anything out there that we're missing that other colleagues are are talking about doing? Um, and are we even having those conversations? Yeah, Mr. Solomon, uh, I think um, I think all the districts are in a similar boat, um, and we are having those conversations amongst many other conversations. And um, really, <clears throat> the only variability that you're seeing is is timing. So you know, some folks are choosing to to take some steps this year to try to shore their deficits. Uh, some folks are, are making the decision to wait until the 21-22 school year in anticipation of conditions being worse then than they are for this particular budget. Um, but there, there's not a district in the county that doesn't have a deficit and a sizable deficit at that. <clears throat> Ms. Marcel, do you have a question? I just had a really quick question. Um, I know, um, Mr. Bialik, you mentioned that running this scenarios for no tax, uh, no tax increase for the full amount, but could, I was just wondering, Mr. Stone, if we could also run one that's in the middle, just so that we could just kind of see um, what those options look like. Yeah, I can. I can. I can absolutely do that. Okay, and thank you very much for all the great work that you've been doing um, already and the work tonight is really helpful for seeing the situation that we're in. So thank you. You're 
Okay, uh, anyone else? This is a very sobering conversation. And, uh, you know, I give you uh, all a lot of credit to be working with this every day. We're all dealing with things in our own lives, our own professions, but you're deep in it every single day trying to think of um, ways to balance not affecting education, not affecting our employees, uh, not affecting 2020, and not affecting 2025 uh, as, as little as possible or as much as possible. Um, and I don't envy your, your positions at all. Um, I'm speaking to the administrators on this, on this call right now. Uh, very, very difficult. And I don't see how it, uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how it all shakes out. Okay. Um, hey. Do you have anything else, Bill? Uh, I'm all finished. Thank you very much. Okay. Dr. Mike has a question. Who has a question? I've got one. Oh, sorry, Mike. I didn't see. Oh, no, no, it's okay. It's hard to do. <laughs> it's fine. Um, I just read. I got an email blast uh, as part of this. We're about to enter another month of complete shutdown of our economy down here. Um, Bill, this is only going to get worse. I mean, it really is. Um, so while I think your numbers are fairly pessimistic, um, they're probably right. They may not be pessimistic enough yet, uh, un unfortunately. In, in light of the fact that now we this this county this area of the United of the of the state of Pennsylvania is looking at June fourth before we're even remotely close to opening anything back up now. So um, I feel for you, um, but this is going to be tough. We're going to have to p pass a budget before we really know what's going on. That's correct. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. This, Stone. Thank you, Mr. Bollock, Ms. Marcel. Um, Mr. Bollock, anything else before we uh, move on to any public comment on this topic? Uh, no. Uh, Kristen, do you have anything? No? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Ms. O'Grady, any public comment uh, relative to finance? No public comment. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Block, you want to uh, wrap things up for us? Uh, yeah, I haven't been to a Council Rock school board meeting that's been this long yeah. as, as far back as I can almost remember. Um, so uh, hopefully that's not the norm, but we have our work cut out for us. So you know, I do want to thank the administration. Uh, a lot of tough topics that we're dealing with, and we didn't, even, we didn't even talk about a lot of the other stuff that's happening as a result of this. Um, I did want to end on a high note, though, and um, uh, May 4th to 8th was uh, Teacher Appreciation Week, and uh, I know that a lot of folks were, uh, were shouting, uh, shouting out to our teachers on social media um, and, and all different platforms, and, uh, you know, what, what they're doing is, uh, is, is amazing, um, and, and, and what they're dealing with while they're doing it is, 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 is likely tough, so um, just uh, wanted to be you know, be on behalf of the board, um, let them know how appreciative we are for what they're going through, but more importantly, what, what they do. And, and then lastly, um, to all the moms out there, just wanted to wish all of y'all a, a happy Mother's Day. Um, and uh, I guess we'll, uh, we'll see y'all in a couple of weeks. Hang in there, everybody. So Andy, just uh, one more question, if you don't, or a comment, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. so we, we saw the, the, the number of people drop uh, exponentially throughout the whole meeting to where we started at 90 some people. And now we have 10, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if there's a way, the, the discussion we had uh, at the end where Bill showed the financial situation we're in is vitally important for our community to see. So if there's some way that we can get this message out to our community um, in an effective way, I think it'll be very helpful in putting things in perspective. Uh, I appreciate all the emails we get about the different topics that are going on in the different in the district and what are important to people. But um, this is a common trend that we see that when we get to the numbers of finance, these things are kind of boring to some folks, and it's not as passionate to some folks or to many folks. If there's a way we can get that message out there, uh, I think that'll be helpful to everyone. Will do. Thanks, Mr. Bollock. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.
Later.